I was a child of divorce and, as such, was often taken by my dad on weekends when I was a kid. He spent most of that time waxing his car at my grandparents, who lived out in nowhere North Carolina, since he lived in a condo with no hoses to wash his precious. Ignored, my brother and I were typically left to our own devices and wandered the fields and woods around my granddad's land, which was about a half-hour drive from civilization. My family owned the neighboring homes and great swatches of land between and behind the homes, so we could pretty much explore out there for hours. All this said, there were some really disturbing things that happened there, and I personally think they're either too absurd or too subtle to have been my childhood imagination. You can decide for yourselves, though, and I'd love to hear what you guys think might have been going on. Here are some things I remember. My great-uncle was the kind of a jack-of-all-trades. He bought and sold used cars. He also bought wrecks to strip and scrap dumping the useless husks in a field and the woods up a trail behind his house. My brother and I called this place the car graveyard. On its own, it was eerie, with cars all the way back from the 50s in various states of disrepair. I used to climb inside them, until I got into one that was tacky, with what might have been dried blood. Sometimes I'd find bones out there, deer mostly, but they'd be in odd places like skulls on car hoods. My guess is that it was just poachers on his land messing around because he didn't hunt, but who knows. I never saw any with skin or fur. One day, my brother and I were going to the car graveyard, but up the trail to it, we started to hear what sounded like pained moaning up ahead, where the derelicts were. We turned tail that day. Oddest, perhaps, from the car graveyard, was the one time we actually went really far back to see just how deep the cars went. It continued into the woods for a while, with trees sometimes growing right out of the wrecks. My brother and I saw something ahead that looked like fog or mist, which reminds me of another story, but that's for another day. We didn't think much about it because we were kids, but this was mid-afternoon and the mist was only in one area. We passed on through and felt inexplicably weird and decided to give up on seeing just how far back it went. When we got back to my granddad's place, things seemed off. It was really hard to explain. My dad looked like my dad and acted like him, but he didn't feel the same. My brother felt this same dissonance too, and we got this wild idea that when we crossed the fog, we somehow stepped into another dimension maybe just slightly different from our own. Maybe it was just stupid kid stuff, but I still remember how oppressive this feeling of not belonging was. We booked it back across the fog again, and when we came back, everything immediately felt as right as rain. We went back as an adult to that same spot. No fog, but there was a particularly off-putting sensation. A few other odd things happened out there, but not in the car graveyard. We heard laughter coming from a hole in the woods. I swore that I saw the stereotypical sheet ghost near the woods, but as soon as I looked, they vanished. I regularly saw a face in the shadows between the trees across the field. It reminded me of Morlock from the 60s time machine. I saw a log truck carrying a bear on its back that was as tall as a house. It was probably some fiberglass thing for a store or putt-putt golf, but it was still a really odd thing to see. I hesitate to add this one because it's just so goofy, but what the heck. One day, my brother and I were messing with my granddad's walkie-talkies, and we saw this really odd-looking bird in the sky. We joked that it looked like a flying monkey from The Wizard of Oz, and said, Flying monkey, flying monkey, come in flying monkey, into the walkie-talkies. Another voice came through and said, Someone get me a flying banana. A bit spooked, we went into the kitchen and took a banana to leave it outside, and we stayed indoors for the rest of that visit. When we left, only the peel was sitting outside. That's about all I got for that area. A few things happened inside the house too, but... That's not really pertinent to this story. (laughs) 
So I used to live near an infamous road. It's a thin road with no street lines, has only a few houses at the end, and is lined with thick woods. There were no street lights. We heard stories like ghosts being spotted in the woods, weird beasts, creepy vibes, and a penny thrown off a small bridge coming back to you. Things like that. Urban legends, really. My boyfriend and I decided to drive down it one night in his car. It was a small stick shift car. The road had several pull-offs where you could park and sit. We pulled off at the first one and took some footage of the woods. Nothing happened. So we continued driving to the next pull-off. We parked and shut off the car. We heard some rustling, but we both assume that it's an animal moving away from the sound of the car parking. We sat there for a few seconds in the dark of the woods. We heard something hit the car like a rock or something. Then we heard several pounds on the truck and the roof. At this point, we decided to drive off. He attempted to start the car to no avail. He tried this several times before it eventually did start. He then put it in gear and stepped on the gas, but the car stood still. I was freaking out and told him to stop messing around. He said he wasn't. Then the car, while in first gear and the gas was depressed, began to be pulled backwards. Against all logic, the car was fighting to go forward against something that wasn't visible. The taillights lit up the forest behind us, and there was absolutely nothing there. Out of nowhere, the car miraculously just jumps forward, and we drove away from the pull-off. Blown away by this experience, we decided to find another pull-off. This was stupid. The one we found was before the bridge where pennies are thrown. We go over to the bridge and throw a penny. We hear it hit the small stream. We look back at the car, and we swear that we see somebody walk behind it. So we rush back to the car, but there's no sign of anyone. This was the last straw, so we decided to get off that road ASAP. We get in the car and we speed off. As we're driving, something small hits and chips our windshield. It did not sound like a rock. It sounded like a penny. Whatever was on that road wanted us gone, and we haven't gone back since. Last year, I was backpacking deep in the mountains in Montana. I was near Libby, Montana, about three hours west of Glacier National Park. I was hiking alone, and I expected to encounter bears, moose, etc. I'm experienced, and I know how to handle them, so I wasn't scared. But this time, I was way out in the middle of nowhere, with nobody around for miles. Also, no cell service anywhere and I didn't have my emergency beacon with me. Usually, I expect to see other hikers on the trail, but not here. Nope. I was out there completely alone, and I knew it. Well, it was like nine miles to my camp up at Cedar Lake. About halfway, the trail opened up, and I was in a somewhat clear area and had better visibility of what was around me. There were still trees and green undergrowth covering the ground. A few minutes later, I see something quickly scurry across the trail, maybe 50 feet in front of me. I stopped, froze, and waited. The creature noticed me, and then stood up in the undergrowth, but still almost completely covered by the tall grass and shrubs. It was about three feet tall, pitch black, 50 to 60 pounds, and obviously very quick and intelligent. I assumed it was a baby black bear at first, so I didn't move or make a sound, and I got my bear spray ready, fully expecting an angry mama bear to come roaring out of the trees at me. But thankfully, that didn't happen, because I surely would have been attacked or at least bluff charged. All I could see was its face through the tall grass. The creature stared at me invasively for about 30 seconds. I was staring back at it. I didn't move a muscle. Then, suddenly, it huffed loudly at me and then ran through the grass up the side of the hill and I never saw it again. 
The sound it made was a lot deeper than you would expect from something that small. It was like a bear's growl. You could almost feel it inside your chest. Very unsettling. I stood there silently and waited for another few minutes to see if Mama Bear was nearby and that it was indeed a cub, but nothing came. I gingerly passed through that area on the trail and kept hiking. My research tells me it may have been an otter or a mink, but I've seen them before, and this wasn't like anything I've seen before. It was the way it moved. I only saw it for a second, but it almost slithered on the ground like a reptile, and then stood up on its hind legs and watched me, making me feel really uncomfortable. There was something sinister about it. I checked for tracks, but couldn't find any. I have no idea what that thing was. Before I get into my story, I'd like to give a little background about my dog growing up. His name was Fonzie because he had long black hair with a white patch on his chest. Growing up, he was my best friend and protector. He was a mix of Chow and German Shepherd. And if you've ever met a Chow, I'm sure you're well aware that once they imprint on you, they won't accept anyone but you. And they are fearless protectors, which was just multiplied with the mix of German Shepherd. When I was eight, we lived in the foothills of Mount Baker in the Pacific Northwest. It was a not-so-populated area. One evening around dusk outside my house, Fonzie and I were up to our usual shenanigans. He would sit behind me as I shot my BB gun at some targets I had set up on the tree line. All of a sudden, he moved in front of me and started growling, which only happened when he felt that I was in danger. Right after he got between the tree line and me, about 20 feet, a very deep and loud, almost clicking sound came from the trees. Limbs were breaking and you could hear the ground pounding. We were both terrified. He started whimpering, which he never did. We both ran into the house. I looked out the window to see if whatever it was had come out of the woods, but nothing emerged. I told my dad about it, but he didn't believe me. He jokingly said, oh yeah, it was probably Bigfoot. But I've never heard of any Bigfoot story where it charged someone. Black bears tend to stay away from loud dogs, and it was way too loud to be a cougar. So that's my story. It was by far the most terrifying experience of my life, and it still haunts me to this day as a 31-year-old man. So, a little background to set the mood, and this is all 100% true. I grew up in central New York, between Parrish and Mexico. You can look up Happy Valley and see just how creepy it is. Surrounded by woods, farms, fields, gravel pits, and swamps. I'm outside roughly 90% of my day. I do firewood, logging, farming hunting, fishing, and trapping. I'm certainly used to the creepy shit in the woods, so much so that there's a predator light on my walking stick, which is a backwards-facing LED light. People deter tigers from leapfrogging on them by wearing masks on the back of their heads, but we only have fishers, coyotes, and the occasional wandering bear. So every night, on the wood line, I have a pimp fire pit set up that I use pretty much every single night. It's not uncommon to see raccoons and foxes. We feed the birds and even have a huge turkey and deer feeder. My house is basically a safe haven. We constantly have critters running amok in the daytime, and especially at night, in the shadows. So you get used to the random ground leaf flutter, twig snapping, chittering critters in the forest nooks and crannies staring at you, wondering if you're going to eat that last hot dog. 
It can be unnerving, honestly. But then, there's my clicky buddy who always says goodnight to me. It began when I moved into a good buddy's house. He and I are very much alike. Hard-working outdoorsmen who hunt, trap, and collect firewood. I've recently gone through some changes in my life, and I was lucky enough to move in with him, which is only four miles away from where I grew up. Every night, after working or running through a trap line, I'd work on my fire pit, which is in a clearing we made to store firewood right on the edge of the forest. I'd hear this clicking, like a slower version of the predator's clicks. The sound was kind of random at first, but then I noticed it reacting to me moving. Grabbing a beer, click, click. Packing a pipe, click. Building up the fire or taking a leak, click, click. At first it freaked me out, like to the point of carrying a bigger knife than I should. Some nights a loaded 223. A couple of those wandering bears came within a quarter mile of my fire pit, so. I wear a headlamp, I have a lit lantern by me, a roaring fire, a machete, the walking stick, so I'm pretty comfy, even though I'm kind of crapping my pants as I yell at the darkness to come and get me. So when the fire dies down, no more smoke for the pipe or hot dogs for my belly, I'll start packing up my stuff and get ready to head inside. Click, click. I look around for eye shine. Nothing. I move closer to the woods, stray a little to reposition my headlamp casting shadows. Click. I've even clicked back, and it kind of responded to me a few times, but I could just be stoned out of my gourd. I mean, it's freaked me out so much a few times, I've literally built up the fire just to walk away. My fire pit is built for that kind of thing. I'm literally a pro at having fires. When I did, click, click. Now, we do have nocturnal flying squirrels here. And one trick the squirrels, all squirrels, do is that they'll hide on the opposite sides of trees as you pass by. You'll never see or hear them. You won't know that they're there. Unless a friend is walking 20 feet in the same direction and you're both looking up at the trees, the squirrels can't hide from both of you. But I don't think this is what I'm hearing. It would make sense, since I can't see whatever's making the noise, but they tend to chitter more than click-click. So now it's been over a year or so of hearing this sound, and I'm nowhere closer to finding out what it is. I've come to accept it. I'll even leave some food at the edge of the woodline, beginning of a trail for it, which is usually where I relieve myself and then go back to the fire or inside. So almost every night, I'll hear the clicks. And I'll say goodnight back. Or call its mom a dirty name. I mean, I don't speak click. Who knows what I'm saying? But I click back anyway. And then I head inside. I suppose this isn't a scary story. It's just creepy, and I wanted to share it. My friend and I were hiking in Blue Ridge, Georgia. We were just going camping for one day and the trail was part of the Appalachian Trail, near the very start of it. My friend told me a story about one of his friends, and said that he heard voices and footsteps at night near Blood Mountain. He said that he had to night hike because the noises were so intense. We found a campsite, and we set up shop. As it got darker... We got a bad feeling, like something was watching us. And then, it started. We saw a pair of red glowing eyes, about 100 to 150 feet away from our fire. Then, my friend goes to dunk his head in the creek near our tent, and he explains that something pushed him into the water. His shirt was soaked and he hit his nose on a rock and was bleeding. 
After that, we heard a woman's voice. It was speaking, but we couldn't really make out the words. We heard it in front of us, behind us, and to the left of us over the creek. It could have been a hiker, but to the left, there was no trail. And if it was somebody night hiking, they weren't using a flashlight. We also heard footsteps around us and sticks snapping. Finally, we just got in the tent and tried to sleep. My friend fell asleep before I did, and I heard twigs snapping right next to my head outside of the tent. That was pretty much our entire night, but it was very, very creepy. If you decide to go camping in Blue Ridge, just know there are things out there lurking in the night. I know it might seem stupid, but this sound has bugged me since the day I first heard it back in May. I could swear that I've never heard anything like this. I went with my dog in a pretty offhand natural reserve in Italy for a walk. This one is a particular reserve. It's not like a park. It's wild, and no human activity is allowed except for monitoring and hiking in specific days of the month. It's because it's the habitat of a very rare bird, but I can't remember which one. This means that I was basically alone with my dog. But still, it was a super sunny day, and the place isn't dangerous at all. No slopes, no hard paths, only a very big river. And... If you avoid getting super close to it, you'll have no problems with it. Everything was great, until lunch. While eating, out of nowhere, I started to hear this very strange noise coming from multiple directions in the woods. Now, it was super weird, since I've read all the info of the reserve, and it says that whenever they make monitoring operations, they deny access and I was pretty sure that I was the only person there. This place only has one entrance, and it's totally surrounded by a swamp. There are no cars except for mine, and not a soul out there. The closest structure is about 25 kilometers away from that place. My dog started to bark and became so nervous that I had to calm her down for a while. Something like this has never happened before. My dog, a lab, has heard many noises in the woods, even louder than this one, but has never gotten nervous. I'll try to explain what the sound was like. The best way I can describe it is that it was like a loud metallic bang, like when you hit a stick against a metallic can, immediately followed by the sound of an engine failing. Like when you try to start an old tractor and it won't. It occurred three or four times per minute and lasted about seven to eight seconds each time. The noise made my dog and I very uneasy. I don't know why. I'm used to hiking in the woods, even at night. And in my life, I've heard much scarier sounds, like thunder and lightning striking close to the ground, very close to my house. But this one was somehow dreadful. It made me and my dog freak out, so I decided to pack everything up, head back to the car, and leave the area as soon as possible. The noise never stopped. It continued to occur in the same way I described it. And there's another weird thing. It always sounded very close. No matter where I went or how far I parked my car, around an hour of hiking from the spot I first heard it, it always sounded like it was the same distance away, like it was following us, maintaining about 30 meters of distance. My dog calmed down and fell asleep only when we were in the car and halfway back home. I felt super tired, too, as soon as I calmed down, and I barely managed the drive to my home. 
trying not to fall asleep the whole way. That evening, I had a massive headache and felt very off, so I immediately drifted to bed. In your opinion, what was that? I didn't cross anyone to ask them on the reserve or at the office. It was closed that day. Nobody has ever been able to tell me what produced that noise. Plus, as I said, the reserve is super close to a river and a swamp. Maybe those things are connected. What do you think? I live in a part of Alaska where there's nothing but woods all around. I'm the only person who lives in these woods for about 20 miles in all directions, so visitors are always a special event. This time, however, it was a creepy event. I decided to go camping in the woods about five miles away from my cabin because I was stressed out that week and needed to get away from it all. I found a nice clearing and set up camp before nightfall. These woods aren't very quiet. There are always birds chirping, the rustling of leaves, and bunnies and deer running about. It was about 7 o'clock p.m. when the first incident happened. I was listening to the wilderness outside of my tent while the fire was dying down outside. I had my pack strung up in a tree and had my 12-gauge shotgun unloaded to my right. All of a sudden, all the noises in the area stopped. But then, I heard what sounded like snow crunching. I thought it was just a deer. The only real predators in the area that I had known about were bears. But this was far too heavy to be a deer, or a bear. It was circling my camp. All I could hear was the snow crunching underfoot. It sounded like it was a two-legged animal, slowly getting closer. It did this for hours. I had my 12-gauge ready, but only remembered it wasn't loaded when the animal was about seven feet away from my tent. I grabbed my box of buckshot and put the first shell in. Click. The footstep stopped. Click, click, click. I kept straining to hear anything, but it never came. I fell asleep for a few hours, but woke up at about 2 a.m. My tent was open. My shotgun was right outside of my tent. I felt like I was being watched. All I could see were the stars in the pitch black nothingness, but two stars moved. I didn't know how to react. The two stars that moved were now coming closer. They were eyes. The animal had to have been nine feet tall. It kept coming, closer. I could smell it now. It smelled like rotten meat and death. My shotgun was only a foot away from my hand. I carefully grabbed it. I prayed that it was still loaded and that this thing hadn't unloaded it. I pumped a shell into the chamber and took the shot. The light was almost blinding against the dark wilderness, but what I saw was worse. It was hairy, too hairy to be a human, too long to be a bear. Its feet were gigantic, and they were a darkish color. The face had no hair, but was the same color as the feet. The eyes were huge and were looking right at me. The mouth was wide open, and the teeth were long and yellow. The arms were long and hairy, just like the legs. Its height was about nine feet tall, like I said, maybe a few inches less. After the shot, I heard a scream that shook the tent and the ground around it. I hit the animal. I heard it run off into the wilderness, screaming all the way. I started packing right up in the pitch black night, looking up at the stars. Nothing moved this time, though. As I was leaving the clearing in which I made my camp, 
I looked back and saw those same huge eyes shining in the darkness, and they moved toward me. I ran through the woods, unsure of where I was going or what time it was. I could hear the leaves snapping behind me, and when I looked back, the eyes were there, but they were closer this time. I saw the lights of my house in the distance through the thick woods. I could still hear the snapping, but it was farther back this time. I made it home and locked my door. The paranoia almost made me pass out. I still felt like I was being watched, even though I closed all the curtains. The only window without curtains or blinds was a very small window that was above the kitchen sink. I was in the living room for about an hour. It was now 5.30 in the morning, and the sun would be rising. I looked around the house, still paranoid. I saw the window above the sink in the kitchen, but there was nothing there. I felt relieved, for a second, until the eyes moved into place there, looking right at me. We made eye contact, and I saw the first rays of sunlight come through the window. The animal grunted and stomped back into the forest, shaking the ground and cabin as it moved. I don't see it often anymore, but it does show up. Sometimes, when I'm in the living room watching a movie, or making food in the kitchen, I see the eyes. It only comes at night, but it's there. I feel that we've come to an agreement. I stay away from the woods at night, and I don't get eaten. I'll update you if anything else happens, but it's been months since the first incident, and nothing drastic has happened yet. It hasn't shown up in the last few days, actually. But... I'm sure it'll be back soon. Where I live, we have had relatively few bid cases. There were almost none at all back in the fall. Because of that, Although we were still living under certain restrictions, we had more public health sanctioned freedoms than many other places. For example, at the time, we were permitted to share our social bubble with one other household and travel within our region. My family and our fellow bubble family decided to take advantage of this by going on a fall getaway. We rented two side-by-side -side cabins in a beautiful waterfront wooded area and had a lovely relaxing weekend. Although there were other cabins nearby, most were not occupied and we saw no other people, although we did hear a dog barking a few times somewhere not far off. On our final night there, my son decided to sleep in the other cabin with his bubble siblings. Around 11 p.m., he called over, asking for some forgotten thing. It was a very dark night, and there were certainly no streetlights in the deeply wooded cabin area, so I grabbed my flashlight and walked the short distance to the neighboring cabin to deliver whatever it was that he needed. On the walk back, I heard a whistle. It was a very human-sounding whistle, exactly the kind of whistle one makes to call in a dog. It sounded very close, but shining my light around, I saw nobody. I heard it again, and assumed someone was whistling for the dog we'd heard earlier, so I didn't think much of it. A short time later, another call came from next door. My son couldn't settle and wanted to come back to our cabin. This time, my husband and I both walked over, collected our child and his stuff, said goodnight to our bubble family, and walked back. We heard the same whistle again, several times. It seemed to be on the dirt road ahead of us, moving gradually away. My husband commented that the dog must have gotten loose, and the owner was out looking for it. Inside our cabin, we continued to hear the whistling coming at irregular intervals of maybe two to four minutes. 
At first, it would be loud and seemed quite nearby. Then, it would gradually grow fainter, then stop, as though the whistler had moved out of earshot. Then it would seem to circle around, coming from the other direction, getting louder as it moved past our cabin, then fading again into the distance. Then it would start all over again. Still not thinking much of it, my husband climbed into the loft to go to sleep, while I started to pack for the trip home the next day. Our son was sleeping in a little room on the main floor to the left of the front door, and the small window in his room was cracked open to let in the unseasonably warm night air. I was standing by that window, quietly gathering his scattered things, while the whistle once again drew closer. But this time, instead of fading as it passed by, the next one was very close and incredibly loud, as though the whistler was just outside my son's window. The blind was down, but I was sure someone was on the porch, right outside. I leapt to the front door, flung it open, and threw on the porch light, ready to tell off some prankster on our doorstep. Nobody was there. I grabbed my flashlight and took a few steps out past the circle of light, then thought better of it and retreated inside. I locked up the cabin, closed and latched all the windows and lowered all the blinds. If someone was creeping around outside our cabin, I didn't want them looking in at us from the darkness. Deciding that I did not want to leave my sleeping son downstairs by himself, I settled on the sofa with a book. The whistles continued. Between each one, I would convince myself it was just a bird or an animal, only to hear it again and be certain that it could only be a human sound. The irregularity of it and the slight variations in pitch and tone also told me that it wasn't something mechanical or electrical or automated. Around 1.30 in the morning, my husband suddenly got up and started to get dressed. I asked him what he was doing. I'm going to find out whoever that is and ask them why they've been whistling for hours, he said. I was horrified. My husband is a pretty big guy, and I was as curious as he was. But I also felt deep in my bones that it would not be safe for him to go outside that night. I insisted that he go back to bed, and thankfully he did. I sat vigil, listening to the intermittent whistles for at least another hour, until finally I dozed off on the sofa. When I awoke, it was morning. The sun was peeking around the blinds, and the whistling had stopped. I cautiously peered outside, half expecting to see some sort of evidence of a nightmare intruder, but there was none. A little while later, we wandered next door, coffee mugs in hand, to get our friend's take on the mystery whistler. Amazingly, they had not heard a thing, despite the fact that the sound was so clearly audible in our cabin and would have had to have passed right by them. We couldn't understand how they hadn't heard it. At checkout, I asked the woman at the kiosk down the road about it, but she just looked at me strangely and said she didn't know what it could have been. When I got home, I searched for audios of bird calls common to the area, and then ones not common to the area, in the hope of finding that same whistle. Nothing I found was even close, and we still don't know what we heard that night, circling for hours and stopping just outside our cabin door. So this happened relatively recently. My friends and I were living at a cabin in Lake Tahoe in California. It was in May, so not snowing, but the nights got down to near freezing temperatures. We had gotten some firewood burning in the fireplace, and the three of us were chilling around it. 
We were drinking scotch and had turned down all the lights all the way down in the cabin. The nearby houses were about 300 yards out, and they had their lights down as well. We heard creaking on our roof for two to three seconds, which stopped. That was followed by what sounded like a bag or something mildly heavy dropping on the roof. Then it was followed by the scariest, heaviest rumble any of us had ever heard. The entire roof shook, but nothing else in the house did, so we knew it wasn't an earthquake. We almost felt like something broke the roof and was coming down the stairs to get us. We screamed and picked up the hot fire pokers and searched through the cabin, tapping walls and the attic area. We looked up the chimney for raccoons, as they tend to hide there. Also, this wasn't the first night we had had the fire. If a raccoon mama was nesting, she would have fell through the chimney. We found nothing. We saw our neighboring house turn on their lights, and they came out with searchlights. They had heard a similar sound. We all thought a bear had run from our roof to theirs, but it's unusual for a bear to do that. The neighbor's dog was quiet through it all. I checked that there was no way out from the chimney besides up, so if something was in there, it couldn't have escaped the roof without popping the lid, which was intact. We don't know what it was. For the next two nights, we had a fire up. Nothing. Not sure what it was. And perhaps I'll never know. Growing up, I had a childhood friend that lived relatively close by. We were like two peas in a pod. We were both adventurous, believed in the paranormal, enjoyed astronomy, and generally just being outside. She was born in Alaska, and her dad lived there for quite a while. So they were always into camping, hiking, fishing, skiing, you name it. It was with my friend's family that I got introduced to fishing and did a lot of camping. This happened during the mid to late 90s, and we were maybe around 10 to 12 years old. It's been a while, so I can't remember exactly. One camping trip, we went to this lake in the forest that was surrounded by a meadow. And feeding the lake was a small stream leading out of the woods. Anyway... We played in the meadow and stream all day while my friend's dad fished. The lake wasn't very big, and because it had a meadow all around it, he could keep an eye on our whereabouts while he fished. While messing around by the stream, the wooded area it was coming from gave me weird vibes. Can't explain it, I just felt really uneasy. Anyway, the day faded away into early evening, and it was time to leave and find a camping spot. My friend's dad picked up his fishing gear and we all walked back to the truck on this long, winding path through the woods. Once in the truck, we drove into a more remote area of the forest and made our way up this steep road that was so rough and at such an incline that I was convinced my friend's dad was going to break his truck. He had a four, maybe six-cylinder Toyota pickup that was about as basic as a truck could get. In fact, I'm not even sure if the truck had four-wheel drive. But being an Alaskan outdoorsman with years of experience, I trusted him. We finally made it up to the top, which was flat and relatively open, with a big area of forest in the opposite direction from the road we drove up. We pitched our tents, got everything set up, and my friend and I decided to go explore the area. We were maybe 50 yards from the tent when we heard a big crack as a tree branch snapped in the woods behind us. We got quiet and looked in that direction, but didn't see anything. Thinking it was just a deer, we brushed it off. As we were walking, we heard it again and whispered to one another about what it could be, but kept going. It stopped briefly and when we were about 200 yards from our camp, 
we sat on a boulder looking down the steep wooded hill overlooking the dirt road from where we'd come. Suddenly, we heard another cracking branch from behind. Whatever it was seemed to be following us. Our imaginations going wild, we came up with everything from a serial killer stalking us in the woods to deer to Bigfoot. When we got back to the campsite, we told her dad what we had heard and how it seemed to be paralleling us. He kind of played it off as a black bear and secured all the food. Later on, my friend confided in me that her dad had gotten out his pistol and would be sleeping with it that night. My friend and I were sharing one tent and he was in his own tent not far from us, so we figured everything would be okay. I awoke some time in the middle of the night to hear something or someone walking outside. As I lay still, listening, I could hear it quietly circling the tent. It sounded like it was walking on two legs, because it had a distinct rhythm in how it walked. Whatever it was sounded big, as I could hear its weight, if that makes sense, as it put each foot down and walked. I could even hear relatively quiet, but deep, heavy breathing at times. As I lay there, listening, I could hear it wandering to the other parts of the campsite, and then back to our tent, almost as if it was walking in a big, repetitive loop. This went on for who knows how long. It felt like an eternity. Terrified and unable to wake my friend, I lay there and listened until eventually I fell asleep. The next morning, I told my friend and her dad about it, but I don't know if they believed me or not. Interestingly, absolutely nothing in the camp was disturbed in any way. The ground was not very soft, and in some places was covered in grass, so there were no footprints either. This is something that I have never been able to explain, and to this day, it lingers in the back of my mind whenever I camp. I always wonder what it was that walked around our tent all night. This incident happened in 1963 in BC. I was 22 and on my honeymoon when I saw a creature, what I would later call a Bigfoot. I saw it in the clear light of day, free of any obstruction, and I have thought about it every day since. My husband and I were camping in the Broken Islands. It was early June, and the weather was beautiful. It was about seven in the evening, and I walked to the edge of the water and began to wade out. The water came up to just below my shorts. I stood there and admired the beauty. The sun had not started to set yet, and there was a peaceful stillness at that moment. My husband was asleep in the tent, and I thought to wake him so we could cook dinner together. I turned back toward the beach, and it was standing there, motionless. I didn't hear it make a sound. The beachhead was gravel and rocks that crunched and clicked as we moved around were everywhere, but I didn't hear this thing at all. I couldn't understand what I was looking at and just stood, frozen. My eyes were going all over its body, trying to comprehend. I thought it was a naked man at first. It was taller than me by a wide margin. I was five foot eight, and this probably was over a foot taller. It was lean and lanky, like a basketball player. It hunched at the shoulders, had long arms that hung at its sides in a non-threatening manner. It had long fingers with black nails. It stood with its legs close together and had long feet, just like its hands and fingers. It had a round head, and the face looked like a person, but different. Something was off. The body was covered in a brownish hair, but its body outline was still visible. The hair stuck up like an orangutan. The skin on the hands, feet, and face was visible and grayish, dusty and ashy looking, 
Its eyes were black, and I couldn't see any other color. We just stood there, looking at each other. I was stunned, and it was indifferent. He never looked away, but he had an expression of indifference. I said, hello, in a broken half-whisper. I couldn't think of what else to do. He smiled at me. His lips peeled back, revealing large teeth like a horse's. They looked too big and square for the mouth. When I looked at it in the face, the eyes at that moment, I realized that this was not a person. It was like a person, but it was something different. A wave of nausea overtook me. I began to vomit and felt faint. The world started to spin. I moved toward the shore and fell on my hands and knees. I heaved with such force into the dirt. The spinning stopped and I sat up. He was gone. I was there on my knees and just kept replaying the incident in my head for I don't know how long. I stripped off my clothes and cleaned myself in the water. The sun was beginning to set, and I got dressed and lay next to my husband. I don't remember sleeping, just fever, chills, and dizziness. We left the next day. I never told my husband what I saw. We split up five years later. I live in Texas. I've remarried, had children, grandchildren, gotten divorced again, and remarried again. I never told a soul about what I saw. I would go to the library and look for books about monsters, trying to understand what it was, that thing I saw. Bigfoot became popular in the late 60s and 70s. I saw the infamous PGF footage. That's not like what I saw. What I stood staring at, what changed me forever, was something else. I came from a typical Texas, all-American family. I wasn't supposed to see this. Now I'm someone with a secret, something I could never talk about in my real life. My interest in this subject has been a complete secret. No one who knows me would ever guess. I have never said this out loud, but in 1963, I saw a Bigfoot. I'm a scout leader in Ireland, and my friend group are all outdoorsy people, so I've done my fair share of outdoor adventures. One time, we were away, camping down on a site in Roscommon. There were about four of us in a dome tent that night, and each one of us heard rustling and moving around outside our tent during the night. We were all scared shitless and didn't mention it to each other until the next morning over breakfast with the others from our group. It wasn't until then that the two others in the other tents spoke up about hearing rustling right outside of their tents as well and something rubbing along their tent wall. Well, we were all convinced that it had to be a wild animal since there were no other people on our site. We had two nights left. It wasn't our first or our last time there. We've stayed there roughly around 15 times, give or take. And while I believe there are wild deer around, I've never seen them in person. Not once. There are always people down there on the site where we stay. So surely... Wild animals would stay clear of that area and wouldn't come right up to the tent walls, right? Another time, while wild camping near Glindalo, several of us in a tent woke up several times to the sound of the zipper on our tent door. It wasn't just a small zipper noise. It was as if the exterior door were being fully zipped open or closed. 
There were two tents, so two groups, but we all decided to kip in together because of how cold it was, so it was nobody from our group joking with us. It could easily have been another group, but while wild camping, the chances of another person or group being close to you are slim. Once we looked around and knew that the door, to our knowledge, hadn't been zipped, and that we weren't in immediate danger, we chose to ignore it. It happened a few times that night. You kind of learn, while camping, to ignore weird noises and movements outdoors. Most nights spent camping, you don't get much sleep, really. You're always conscious of being in the wilderness, and so exposed. It might not be the creepiest of stories. Most of our weird camping or hiking experiences have happened abroad, to be fair. But all the same, it still hasn't put us off camping or being outdoors. Even if we can't be sure what's out there. So, I was a wildland firefighter back in the day, in Arizona. I worked in a forest that was generally popular with a lot of recreation in the northern portion, but I worked in the southern portion of the forest, which was really remote. It barely had any roads or campgrounds, so if you wanted to recreate there, you had to work for it. The fire crew I was on only had two duty stations, one in a small town where the rest of the forest employees worked out of, and one that was about two and a half hours away up a really windy, mountainous road. The remote duty station had an old Forest Service ranger station and a newer double-wide trailer that was recently put in. When I worked at this place, it had no cell reception. When my crew and I weren't working, we were playing horseshoes and watching movies. They did eventually add a cell phone booster, which sadly just made people play on their phones, but I digress. So, as for the creepy story, I want to keep it pretty simple. But my supervisor from that crew had experienced some odd things working up there as well. There was one night that he told me he was cowboy camping, which, if you don't know, means sleeping outside without a tent. And he kept getting a weird, mucusy drop of liquid on his face. He kept looking around, even yelling, but nobody was there. He told me that he wasn't below any trees, so he's sure that it wasn't sap. He never slept outside there, ever again which leads me to believe he was telling me the truth. As for my story, I have had other interesting experiences at that remote duty station, but this one was scary. It was the night of July 4th, and we weren't on a fire, so the crew was playing horseshoes and having a good time. Everyone went to bed pretty early, because we were going to have a PT hike the next day. I had my own small room in the double-wide trailer, and my bed was situated next to a big window. I started dozing off, but felt awake still. That's when I hear one of my coworkers outside my window asking me to come outside. I was laying on my side, facing the window, and I didn't look up, but I felt their presence there. It felt as though something tall was looming over me from outside. They kept beckoning me, and I said no. Pretty quickly, their voice began to change to a deeper, raspier, angrier voice. They started cursing at me. Get the F outside. I just froze. It was sort of a demonic voice, not my coworkers anymore. 
I lay frozen, not moving while they yelled at me. Eventually, it stopped, and I fell asleep. I woke up the next day, and I wanted to ask my coworker if he was standing outside my window, but it felt a little bit too weird. Perhaps this was a mild form of sleep paralysis, but whatever it was, it was really creepy. This took place in a small city in Alaska where I grew up. One night, at approximately 12 a.m. to 2 a.m., I was lying awake. I'm a very light sleeper, and I often have trouble falling asleep. At about that time, I started hearing what sounded like an obnoxious mix of possibly a clarinet or a trumpet playing loud screeches. No harmony, just squeaks and honks in the cold night air. I sat for a while on my bed. I couldn't sleep. It was loud enough for me to hear inside. I went out the front door and stood on the porch and just listened. It sounded like whoever was playing it was a few blocks away. But at the same time, it was as though you could hear it in every direction. It was autumn and very cold at the time. I was so frustrated by the screeching in the late hour that I actually yelled out, Shut up! thinking it was a kid playing a prank. About a year or two later, when I had nearly forgotten about it, I heard the sound again, this time in the daytime in the winter air. It lasted for a few hours and then quit. It wasn't until probably five years after this that I watched a video on YouTube called Trumpets in the Sky about people around the world hearing the exact same noises and not being able to find any explanation for them. It literally gave me the chills. But now it has me wondering, has anyone else experienced the same thing? I live in northern Alabama. I was out rock hounding solo today to a place that my husband and I have gone before. Everything seemed normal when I arrived. It's a very secluded area of the creek, with a rock bar in the middle of the creek, and with a small patch of woods to the left, and a dense forest on the right. I crossed the creek and set up my gear on the rock bar, grabbed a bag, and started walking up the creek. About 45 minutes in, I kept looking up at the forest. I don't know why, but I just kept getting an eerie feeling. Every now and then, I'd hear a couple of thumps out there, but, you know, nature, so I didn't think anything of it. About an hour in, I heard my first meow. I was so focused on pulling clay that I literally stood up and was like, I did not just hear a cat meow, did I? Ten minutes go by and I'm walking farther up the creek, and damn it if I didn't hear it again. I stopped and was like, yep, I just heard a cat meow. How strange. Something really did seem off, though, and I started to feel uneasy, so much so that I turned around and headed back to my sight. Something about the meow just wasn't right. It wasn't a painful meow, but just a matter-of-fact meow, if that makes sense. About five minutes into the trek back, I definitely heard a cat meow. I'm sweating like crazy because of the heat, but instantly I feel cold, clammy, and the hair is standing up on the back of my neck. I know what I was supposed to be hearing a single meow, but it wasn't coming from a cat. It sounded like someone or something was imitating a cat. 
I keep focused on getting back to my site, and about five minutes later, I hear another single meow. Here's where I realize that things are getting really strange. The meow always sounded the exact same distance from me, no matter how far I kept walking. I finally reached my site and pulled out my drinks and plopped down to rehydrate. That's when another meow sounded, and this time I knew with everything in me that it was not a cat that was following me. I calmly gathered up my gear and started to trek across the creek to the path to my car. There was another long meow. I made my way across the creek and hunched down in a pit. I parked my car right next to the edge of the forest and I was really starting to lose my mind. I get my keys and mace out and I put my gear on me so that I can dive into my car and rearrange later. And that's exactly what I did. I nearly crapped myself finding the courage to make it to my car, but I did and I hightailed it out of there, fast. I know that the rational answer is that somebody was out there messing with me, but how did they get back there and why? It's like 200 acres of forest. People don't go back there all that often. I'd have to believe that somebody went back there sat around and waited for somebody to mess with. And how did they follow me without me hearing a crunch or anything? To this day, I can't explain what in the world happened that day, but something was off. All during my childhood, up until recently, I had thought that ghouls were just spooky, imaginative, scary monsters that would come out on Halloween night. But now, I know differently. I now believe they are synonymous with the creatures we know as crawlers. In Arabic folklore, the ghoul is said to dwell in cemeteries and other uninhabited places. Some say that a ghoul is a desert-dwelling, shape-shifting demon that can assume the guise of an animal. It lures unwary people into the desert or into abandoned places to slay and devour them. The creature also preys on young children, drinks blood, steals coins, and eats the dead. It can also take the form of a human it is a particularly monstrous character believed to inhabit the wilderness of Afghanistan and Iran. The Galu demons were known to be part of the underworld and were thought to carry their victims off to the land of the dead to devour them. People who traveled near cemeteries and abandoned buildings or through desert wastelands were warned to be especially vigilant against these creatures. They were thought to be bipedal though with a hunched form, and were known to crawl, and sometimes run, on all four limbs like an animal. I knew there was a reason why I kept warning people to stay away from the forests and surrounding areas. Since we have fewer deserts in the United States, these creatures are frequently encountered in wooded areas in addition to cemeteries. After years of research, I've come to the conclusion that crawlers are actually demons interdimensional demons. The late great father Malachi Martin, in his book Hostage to the Devil, stated, quote, There is a dimension that is devoid of love and compassion, all the qualities that make us human, end quote. I believe it is from that dimension which these demon crawlers come. People from the Middle East are far more familiar with the ghouls, they are able to shapeshift and spend time in cemeteries as they feed off the flesh of the dead. Like I said, I used to think these were just stories, meant for Halloween and scaring kids. But the more research I do, the more I believe they're real. And I think we all ought to be vigilant. A 
few months ago, I read a terrifying post about something that happened in the backwoods in Canyon Lake, Texas. I had commented that I nearly threw my phone because I used to live there for a few years. I truly don't know where to begin this story. I moved there my junior year of high school. My family's house was built from the ground up on the south side of the lake. My parents didn't know that this was the side of the lake that most people avoided. I don't mean to be offensive, it's just most of the people that I knew lived on the north side. I never really understood why, until the event started happening. The house was finished the summer going into my junior year. When we officially moved in, things were great. A few months into me beginning school is when things turned incredibly dark. It all began when my dad put his guitar in our family room by the fireplace. I would come home and something would string the guitar strings so violently it sounded as if somebody had knocked it over. I began waking up to my dad being completely weirded out because all of our cabinet doors and the doors on the first floor would be open. It escalated dramatically from here. We would hear something in the woods, just outside of the porch lights continually. First, we thought it was an injured animal, but dead deer and other wildlife would appear on our property every few weeks. Then we began to see inhuman things. Guests would see something walking in the hallways, opening drawers, and would see a girl in our guest house. My dad constantly hosted events and parties, including his ex-military friends. They would ask us why we were coming to their rooms at night and opening the drawers and closets and then walking out. My dad didn't believe me until his friends began commenting on figures and people in the house. The worst night was when all the doors began opening and slamming, and it sounded as if somebody was walking up and down the stairs going into every room, opening and closing the doors. I could go on and on about the things I saw in that house. It was one of the scariest times of my life. All in all, don't go to Canyon Lake. About a year and a half ago, my girlfriend and I went down to Ohio Pile State Park. We frequent there as we live an hour away and it's one of the best parks within a day's trip for us to hike and swim, mushroom hunt and explore in general. So one day we got bored of the normal hiking areas and places that we had already been. So we decided to drive around the back roads, deeper into the woods of the park, no map, just deciding which way to turn when we got to intersections and going from there. We pass a random old cemetery. It couldn't have been a mile or more down the road when we noticed a more dirt-like road, kind of dilapidated, with a chain in front of it so cars couldn't go in. We decided to park the car and go explore the trail in general. There were no signs for no trespassing or anything like that, so we continued on. I'll never forget the eerie feeling I had as soon as we made it onto the trail or road. Just a general sense of, you shouldn't be here. But I don't listen to that feeling. My girlfriend seems intrigued. There's no one at all around. And it seems like a beautiful secluded area. We head back some more and we notice that up a cutoff was an abandoned visitor center so obviously we had to go check it out. This is when things started to get really creepy. We were about a hundred feet away from the building when that alarm in my head that said, you shouldn't be here, intensified immensely. But I was curious about the building still, and my girlfriend at this time is freaking out internally. She wants to leave and she feels uneasy and unwelcome. I want to explore the building because I love abandoned places. 
In the amount of time it took us to cover that 100 feet, I noticed that the woods had gone completely silent. There were no bugs anymore, no birds, not even the sound of branches swaying in the wind. We get up to the building and my girlfriend is pleading that we go back. I said, let's just take a step in and then we can go. I'm approaching the stairs to the door from the left side and no joke, straight out of a cheesy horror movie, a bird out of nowhere flies into the window of the building. Not five seconds later, I heard what sounded like either a log or a very large branch cracking on the other side of the building. I'd like to clarify that there was no way it was a small branch or twig. It sounded almost like a tree breaking directly on the other side of the building. I pulled out my pistol and walked quickly backwards, facing the building, and I told my girlfriend to walk as quickly and as quietly as she could back to the car. We hopped in and left as quickly as the car would go and drive. I'm still not entirely sure what happened. I know that black bears do reportedly live in the area, though you don't see them too often, and I've never seen one there. But like I said, I suppose it's a possibility, although it doesn't really explain the bird. The second possibility that comes to mind is that it was another human. But the thing that broke didn't sound like a human walking over a branch and breaking it. Like I said, it sounded like a tree snapping when it starts to fall. I've recently gotten into Appalachian folklore and stories, and I've been reading about Wendigos, skinwalkers, crawlers, and such. So for my question, I'm wondering if anybody has ever had a similar experience in Pennsylvania or in general, and if so, what happened? And what do you think it could have been? My girlfriend and I could never figure out why we felt so afraid. Like I said, it could have been an animal and the bird could have been a coincidence, but we both felt an overwhelming feeling like we shouldn't be there and it still gives me goosebumps. I live in Northeastern America in a pretty rural place with lots of hills, not too many neighbors and a lot of forest. Just tonight, I was headed with my mother down our backyard, which is large and relatively clear for about 100 feet. Then it switches to woods. We got to about 30 feet before the woods and I caught sight of some eyes reflecting in my headlamp. They were a good 50 to 100 feet away and I assumed that they belonged to deer. But a few things convinced me that they might not be. Around where I live, Deer will run away if you make enough noise. And we were talking pretty loudly, but the eyes weren't moving. They kept staring directly at us, which is incredibly unlike deer in this area. On top of that, the pair of eyes on the right were very low to the ground and very wide set, too far apart to be deer considering the distance. We stood for a minute remarking on them and neither pair of eyes looked away. So, since we were spooked, we headed back up to the house, got my brother and a machete, and a bat, and a metal pole. I know, a little overkill, but our area has been a little scary lately. We headed back down. I expected the eyes to be gone by that point. I mean, that's how these things usually go, right? But no, they were still there, in slightly different spots than they had been, but not much farther from where they'd been previously. They stared just as steadily as they had before, so we retreated back inside. The logical answer is deer, but the lack of running away, intent staring, and wide set eyes feel like that option is ruled out. Another thought is wild dogs, but we don't really have those in our area. It's possible it could have been a black bear, 
but those are notoriously scared of people. If anyone has thoughts on what this might have been, let me know. Edit. As an update, just to provide more information, there were no visible signs of anything in the area as far as I could tell. The next day I looked for marks on the trees from climbing and saw none. There's a good amount of greenery covering the ground, so it's difficult to look for scat. But there were no signs of any animals having lied down on the ground. We've still been unable to find any evidence that it was something natural. A few years ago, in the northern part of Sweden, I'm going out for a nice evening of fishing. I'm what I guess is called a fishing supervisor. I check that the other fishermen got their licenses, and I do this at a certain area of lakes and streams. This was in late summer, and I had just been doing my rounds, which I usually end by going to a small lake and fly fishing for some trout. This lake, or pond, is pretty deep in the forest, and I rarely see other people out there. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen someone else out there. This lake looks kind of like a crater. It's a perfectly round circle, perhaps 100 meters in diameter, and it contains a natural population of perch and trout. It was a warm summer evening with a slight breeze. The birds were chirping, and the fish were rising to inspect the spawning insects on the surface. I rig my gear and aim for one of the fish, rising to the right in front of me. At the moment that my fly lands on the surface, it's like somebody pressed the pause button on time. The sun hides behind a cloud. The wind stops blowing. The birds are suddenly silent, and the fish stops eating. A smell rises from the ground that I'm standing on. It smells like something dead, something rotten, almost as though I had a carcass buried under my feet. All of a sudden, I'm aware that there's something walking out of the forest behind me, maybe 10 to 15 meters away. It's like I can see it out of the corner of my eye, but still can't see it at the same time. Every hair on my body is on end, and suddenly it's very cold all around me. The thing watching me just stands there, and I don't have the courage to turn around at all. I see my fly sink to the bottom, but I can't move. I can't do anything about it, because I don't dare to move. Then the wind hits me, and it carries the awful smell away. The sun hits me again, a bird is singing somewhere in the forest, and the almost overwhelming feeling of being watched lets go of me. I turn around and there's nothing there. On the lake, the fish start rising again. I packed my gear and threw the backpack on my back and ran for it. I ran through the forest to my car. I hit the gas and I drove like a maniac until I found the big road and civilization once more. I pulled over to the side of the road and just said to myself, what the heck was that? My heart was still racing. I haven't visited the lake since this happened, and I don't know anybody else who has either, so I'm not sure if anybody else has experienced something similar. I've probably visited this place 20 times or more before this happened, and nothing like that had ever happened. The only thing I'm ever really afraid of out there is bears. I do fish at a lot of ponds and lakes that are pretty deep in the forest. There's always a lot of wildlife in these places. Deer, moose, foxes, and the occasional wolf or bobcat, and maybe a bear. I've never been afraid of meeting anybody or any scary person. In fact, other than being cautious about wildlife, I have never really been afraid of anything, except when visiting this particular lake from that point on.
I like to look out for new, out-of-the-way fishing holes. If I'm on a trip and have my gear, I'll pull up a map, look at the different connecting waterways, and try to find back roads that may lead to spots that few people know about. On one trip, about 10 years ago, I'm in western Pennsylvania, and I'm looking for a road to connect me with this small and out-of-the-way stream that I had found on the map. I'm in the country. It's not too desolate, but houses are definitely getting farther and farther apart and looking more and more beat up. I surmise that I'm really close to where this stream is supposed to be, so I turn down a dirt road that leads toward a tree line in the direction that I believe the stream is located. The road starts out in okay shape, but as soon as I pass into the tree line, stuff gets weird. It's mid-afternoon, but the canopy of the trees is so thick that it suddenly looks like dusk. Then the road very quickly deteriorates, starts to close in, and then starts to vanish. There are banks on either side of me, so I figure I'm on some sort of old logging road that rarely, if ever, gets vehicles on it anymore. The road is getting worse and worse. Large rocks start appearing at random places in the road, first sporadically, and then more frequently. It's very unnatural looking. It almost looks like they were placed there on purpose. My car is four-wheel drive, but I'm getting a little worried because the rocks are getting larger. Combined with this is how tight the road is now. Driving around them starts to get a little sketchy. I'm now driving very slowly so I don't pop a tire or make a wrong move and get stuck on the bank or something. The road suddenly takes a very sharp left hand and downward turn. I creep along this turn, but I stop as I see the road continuing down on this weird trajectory. At this moment, my gut starts talking to me and telling me to turn around. But it's also at this point that I realize I can't. The road is not wide enough to do a three-point turn. I could chance it, but if I didn't want to get my front end caught on something that might be pushing over the bank or my back end going off the back in the other direction and getting stuck, I just couldn't do it. I say to myself, keep pushing forward and you're bound to just get enough room to turn around shortly. As I make my way driving this weird downward road with sharp curves and oddly placed rocks, I start to see items off to the sides of the road. At first, it's just garbage. Bottles, boxes, wrappers. Then I start seeing toys. Kids' toys. Lots of them. Like, an uncomfortable amount. Then I start seeing clothes. Some look old and weathered like they've been there for years, and some look fairly new. The amount of clothing I'm seeing also increases. Then I start seeing mattresses. Not like one random mattress. Lots of them. All over the place, and there are dirty and dark stains on them. My gut is now screaming at me to get out of there, but I still don't have room to turn around. While I'm sitting there and trying to figure out what my next move is, I get the distinct feeling that I'm being watched. The moment that feeling hits me, I audibly yell at myself, nope. Then I slam the car in reverse and drive reverse dodging all of the random rocks all of the way back up and out. I do this until the path levels out again. I was in full F this mode, and I just risk making the three-point turn. My back end goes slightly off the bank, and I slam back into drive and pound the gas to throw myself back onto the road and out of whatever dark woods bullshit I had discovered. I have no clue what I happened across that day. Best case scenario was probably some deep woods meth den. Worst case? I don't even want to think about it. All I know is ever since then, no matter what I'm doing, the moment my gut starts to tell me to get out, 
I get out. I was off-roading with some buddies back home in eastern New Brunswick, on the Bay of Fundy. There's this trail we go on that ends on the water, and it's at the site of an old ammunition depot from World War II. We've been here many times during the day, and sometimes at night. You can drive into and through this massive old structure, and up the hill is the admin building for this site. It's pretty far into the woods. At the very top of that hill are some grave markers from hundreds of years ago. We were told that they were old private graves. We live on the coast, not at all something that I would doubt being a real thing. We were in there one night in the big building having a fire, and we all saw and heard something quite large scramble up the side of the building and then start running on top of it. Now, there are a dozen of us there, so it's clearly not just one person seeing something crazy. There is nothing in the woods of Eastern Canada that should be able to climb as quickly as what we saw. A black bear, maybe. But this thing basically ran up the side of a four-story tall structure and then ran across the top of it in moments. Needless to say, we got in our trucks and hightailed it out of there. On another occasion, we were exploring the admin building, which is three stories tall. It's concrete and it's been abandoned since World War II. We go all the way to the top. Nothing weird happens. But as we're coming back, we notice something weird on the second floor. An entire room is filled with lit candles, but there's nobody around whatsoever. We ran out of there so fast. This one, I will admit, could have been an elaborate prank, since lots of people would go and mess around there since it was a fun off-road trail with some history. But the thing that climbed up the building, to this day, that still mystifies me. This story happened to me in the backwoods. It's not paranormal, but that doesn't make it any less terrifying. I work in forestry, and I had a bear that was clearly not afraid of me and did not want to leave me alone. I pulled into our campsite at around 1 a.m. with the truck and trailer, and it's just me out there. I've got to set up two generators, one for the trailer so I don't freeze to death, and one to keep the equipment that we use warm so we can actually use it in the morning and the batteries don't die. I also got there late because I was having truck problems. I had no idea what the cause of them was. It kept dying and then it would be fine, repeating this process over and over. I set up the generator for the trailer and as I was getting the second one out of the truck, I hear a branch snap loudly. I stop and listen, and I can hear more branches snapping and some rustling in the trees. About 50 meters away into the trees, this noise keeps happening, and it's getting closer. I thought it was a person at first, so I yelled, Who's there? and got no reply. The noises come right up to the edge of the clearing I'm in, a circle maybe 40 meters across and then they stop. I know whoever it is is just sitting there watching me. After about 15 seconds of me listening hard, half in the truck, I see two eyes appear, and then they rise up to about six feet in the air. I could tell it was a bear by the way it moved, which was actually a relief, because for one, it meant that it wasn't a skinwalker, and two, because I knew that there were only black bears around there and no grizzlies. 
but I didn't have anything to really defend myself with. No bear spray or gun or bear bangers, anything like that. I yelled at the bear. Nothing. I hopped in the truck and pulled the air horn out. It didn't even move. I slowly walked over to the trailer, which was still hooked up to the truck, and grabbed a pot and pan and just started smashing them together at it while yelling. It still didn't move at all. It just stood there, staring at me. It wasn't making any noises either. No huffing or pawing at the ground like I knew bears do if they get upset. But that didn't exactly put my mind at ease, considering that this thing was clearly not afraid of me. Eventually, after about 15 minutes of making loud noises and it doing nothing but staring at me, it finally dropped to the ground, turned around, and started to walk away. I waited for about five minutes since I still had to set up the second generator, which I had to bring closer to the bear. Picture a triangle. I was at one corner, the bear was at another, and where I needed to bring the generator was at the third. Right as I pulled the generator out of the truck, I hear branches snapping again, and it's coming back. It came back to the edge of the clearing and did the exact same thing. Stood there, staring at me, and wouldn't leave with all the noise I was making. Again, after another 15 minutes of it sitting there, motionless, it left again, and I quietly dragged the generator out, started it, ran back to the other generator, started that one, got in the trailer and shut the door, and watched out the window for a while at where it kept coming back to. It never showed up again. Maybe it did after I went to bed, but there was no sign of it in the morning. I know it's not the most insane thing that's ever happened to anybody, but it was intensely disturbing, knowing that this thing could easily kill me and wasn't afraid of me and didn't want to leave. It remained so perfectly still, staring at me for such a long time, and I couldn't do anything about it because I had half set up the trailer already and I couldn't leave quickly. Even if I could, there was no guarantee my truck would even start, and I still had a job to do that required me leaving the probably illusionary safety of the truck and go closer to the bear in a way that would mean that if it decided I was worth the trouble, it could get to me faster than I could get back into the truck. I've had other experiences. I had a grizzly charge my truck down at top speed up north, then decided halfway to me that I was a lot bigger than it was and wasn't worth it. Everybody knows bears are fast, but there's a difference between reading the number 50 kilometers per hour or even seeing a video and seeing it in person. An animal that big has no right to move that quickly. It just seems unnatural. I've also heard plenty of very odd noises at night. And the feeling of being watched at night is nearly constant. I stay overnight way in the middle of nowhere alone on a regular basis for my job. And it's very easy to psych yourself out. Late at night, alone, with no way to contact anyone except for unreliable GPS text messaging and hours from anything resembling civilization. I've been doing this for years and I'm still not used to it. I've definitely encountered a skinwalker or something like it once, but that's another story for another time and was before I started this job. Anyway, that's my bear that wouldn't leave me alone story. Hope you enjoyed it. For some background, I'm 23 and I have lived in the country all my life, growing up on the east side of Lake Winnipeg and moving to the west side as a teenager. This story takes place when I was 17 and it's true. A few years after my family moved, I started dating my boyfriend at the time. I lived within the small town, but my boyfriend lived about 15 minutes out surrounded by woods. His only neighbor was about a mile down, 
I'm using miles because country roads here are done in mile sections, not kilometers. On a September night, I was at his house watching movies and things like that. I wanted to go out for a cigarette at about 2 a.m. He said he didn't want one, but for some reason, I felt scared to go outside by myself, probably because I was really tired and kind of out of it, so I made him come out with me anyway. We go out onto the front deck in the dark. He's looking at his phone. I'm smoking and enjoying that crisp fall air. Then I heard this distant cry come from the direction of the neighbor's house. It kind of sounded like it could be a dog or a coyote. I asked my boyfriend what he thought it was, to which he replied he thought it was the neighbor's dog. We were both leaning against the house, listening to it, and we noticed that it was slowly getting louder, as though it was getting closer. Then it changed in pitch and tone dramatically and became guttural. It sounded something like a human screeching for their life, but it definitely wasn't human. The type of scream that just immediately makes you feel sick to your stomach and terrified. My blood turned to ice. The back of my neck was prickling and we both just froze. We were just staring at each other, looking around and then back to each other but our feet would move. I don't think I can even fully explain what it sounded like. Again, I've lived in the country all my life. This didn't sound like any wildlife that I have ever heard of. I know people's first response is that cougars and coyotes and foxes can sound like people, but I know firsthand what those calls sound like, and this wasn't that. We listened to that awful sound getting closer and louder for probably two minutes before my boyfriend grabbed my arm and rushed inside. We never lock our doors where I'm from, but damn, did we lock every door and window in the house that night. We jumped into bed, freaking out, trying to make sense of what the heck that was. And we could still somewhat hear it, even from where we were inside. We laid there silently for about 10 minutes, and then out of nowhere, it just stopped. Obviously, we didn't sleep much. The next day, we drove past the neighbor's house, and Dog was fine, just chilling in the driveway. Nothing was out of the ordinary, and it never happened again. To this day, that sound freaks me out. My friends and I are on our way from Chicago back to our home in Evansville, Indiana. As such, we have to drive through the Midwestern country to get there. Pitch black highways surrounded by trees and cornfields. About four hours away from home, my friend screams and I look up. We hit a deer going 50. The poor guy bounced off the front end and was probably dead on impact. We come to a stop and commiserate, call our parents, etc. We're stranded on a quiet highway in the middle of nowhere, trees to our right and a few houses a bit far off to our left, all surrounded by cornfields, of course. My friend is standing outside surveying the damage when we hear a scream, a man's scream, a bit far off to our left. My other friend and I look at each other, wide-eyed. A few minutes pass and we hear one again. I make a joke about skinwalkers and my friend gets back in the car. A bit later, after calling 911, we heard another scream, a woman this time, and it seemed closer. We're waiting on the deputy and nervously joking about whether it's skinwalkers or just crazy woodland people and my friend facing the trees suddenly laughs nervously and rolls up the window. She goes, I just heard clicking noises outside my window and I'm rolling it up because I'm not going to pretend like I just didn't hear that. 
I know that clicking noises are often a thing with skinwalker stories and things like that. We're not really sure what happened. We think maybe something was trying to lure us out into the woods, but we didn't go, obviously. Obviously we survived too, but I don't think any of us are going to forget that experience anytime soon. Let me start off by saying that this is a true story that happened to me when I was about 13, and I'm 27 now. Whether you believe it or not is up to you. My dad used to be a part of a small hunting club in Alabama, just a handful of guys he grew up with. Once a year, we would drive to the small town of Elba to camp for a few days and go hunting. There were a few different areas of land around the town that the club owned, and club members could go hunting there. One of these pieces of land was nicknamed the cemetery because, well, it had an old cemetery on it. Nothing really creepy about the cemetery. It was in the woods and the graves were of a slave owner and the graves were of his slaves. Now in this area of land nicknamed the cemetery, there are five or six green fields. Basically a cleared out area where there are no trees just grass and a buck hut to hunt in. A buck hut is a tree house that you sit in and wait for deer to walk out onto the green field. This particular evening, we were going to hunt on a green field, number one, the plot directly behind the old cemetery. The evening started off normally enough. My dad parked the truck and we walked down the trail to the buck hut. We climbed up and started to wait and watch the woods. A little bit of time passes and my dad tells me that he is going to go out for a short walk to see if maybe he sees any deer on the trail. Keep in mind, I'm 13 years old. Not a big deal. I've hunted by myself before and I'm not afraid of being alone in the woods. Besides, it was still pretty light out. So I said, okay, and he climbed down. It was just me, my 32 caliber Marlin rifle, the grass field in front of me, and the dense woods around me. This is where things start to get strange. I sat there for a freaking eternity, or what felt like an eternity, and it was now almost twilight. My concern for my dad was growing because he still wasn't back yet. I was worried that maybe something had happened to him or that he had gotten lost. However, he's an experienced hunter, and if he was lost, he would yell or fire off a shot. But the woods had been dead silent. I figured maybe he found a good spot that he wanted to hunt the twilight or dusk hour of the day, because that's prime time for hunting. So I focused my attention on the grass field in front of me, just watching, listening and waiting for a deer to walk out onto the field as the light of day began to fade. Just then, across the field, I saw and heard some brush moving and breaking. The thought did cross my mind that it could be my dad, but I highly doubted it. No way it could be him. That would be incredibly dangerous and stupid. I raised up my rifle, pulled back the hammer, aimed it at the moving brush, and patiently waited for what I hoped was a deer to walk out. Then a girl floated out of the woods and onto the grassy field. She was transparent white with a long flowing dress and long white hair. She floated from one side of the field to the other and then disappeared back into the woods. I watched her for a solid minute or two. I couldn't believe my eyes and I was petrified. Now I really wanted my dad back. A short time passed and it's now pitch black and I'm still alone. My concern for my dad was quickly turning into a panic, but I was too afraid to yell or go look for him in the pitch black woods where I had just seen a freaking ghost. I sat there for hours, terrified and alone in the darkness. Thankfully, he finally returned. 
He acted as if he hadn't been gone long at all. I asked him where the hell he'd been, and he said he just went for a short walk up the trail, turned around, and came back. That timeline made no sense. He was gone for hours. It was very unlike him to leave me alone for that long. He was adamant that he had only been gone for 15 to 30 minutes. We walked down the trail back to his truck. I couldn't get out of there fast enough. The whole experience still confuses me to this day. I don't know who the ghost was that I saw. I don't know if my dad went through some kind of time warp where time sped up. I don't really know. What I do know is that I never went hunting there again, and I don't plan on ever going back. Something happened when I was camping 20 years ago, and I can't get it out of my head. If you have any ideas about what this might be, I'm very interested in hearing it. I was visiting my uncle and cousin, Sarah, in rural Pennsylvania. I was about 16, and Sarah was about 12. Sarah asked me if we could go camping, which meant pitching a tent at the top of this huge foothill that was on the property. The foothill was very steep and had woods at the top. I'd never been camping before then, but I figured if anything happened, we could just walk back down to the house. So I said, cool, no problem. We pitched the tent so the woods were directly behind it, with the tent opening facing out toward the scenery and the view. We roasted marshmallows, told campfire stories, and got in the tent around 11 p.m. or midnight. Sarah fell asleep right away but I couldn't, so I was just lying there counting sheep. Suddenly, I heard leaves shuffling in the woods behind the tent, and I heard footsteps coming out of the woods behind the tent. There were a few steps, and then it would stop. Then a few more, and as it got closer, I heard it step on some large rocks. It sounded like a really large hoof stepped on the rock, because it made that same clop sound as a horse. As it got closer to the tent, I could feel the impact of each step in the ground under me, so whatever it was sounded very heavy. At first I thought it was a large buck, and I debated waking up my cousin so she wouldn't miss it. But then it kept coming closer to the tent, closer than a deer or buck ever would have, and suddenly I was overcome with this feeling of full body dread, like something was very, very wrong. Then. I heard a really bizarre sound. It sounded like it was coming from about 8 to 10 feet off the ground, and the best way I can describe it is like someone had a huge roll of masking tape and was pulling off a big section at a time. It was this odd, tearing sound for lack of a better word, and each tearing sound was loud and lasted 2 to 3 seconds. I told myself that it was a deer that it was tearing bark off trees and that's what was making the noise, but deep down I knew something was wrong. I didn't want to risk waking or scaring Sarah, so I just lay there as quietly as possible, praying that whatever it was would leave. But instead of leaving, the tearing sound got closer, still about 8 to 10 feet off the ground. Now it was directly behind the tent, within 5 to 10 feet. Right then, I heard Sarah scream whisper my name, and I realized she was awake and heard it too. She asked me what it was, and I told her that it was fine, that it was just a deer, and to go back to sleep. She said, that doesn't sound like a deer. But I insisted that it was, because I was too scared to make a run for the house with whatever this thing was right outside. So we listened to it slowly move around to the left side of the tent still close, still making the sound every few seconds. And then, things got even weirder. It started moving around to the front of the tent, where the ground dropped off steeply, so each few feet forward was also several feet down. As this thing went around to the front, the sound stayed at the 8 to 10 foot height, and was slowly moving to the right. 
Now, if the thing making this sound was standing on the ground, then the sound should have dropped several feet. But the sound stayed at the same height all the way around. I even wondered if it was a bird, but it was moving too slowly, and that wouldn't account for the hoof steps I'd heard before. After the sound faded into the woods, Sarah and I just lay awake for the rest of the night, too afraid to leave the tent. At first light, we booked it back to the house and told my uncle what had happened. Even though he didn't know what it was, he just shrugged and didn't seem too concerned. But that experience scared me so much I've never been camping since, since I know I didn't hallucinate or imagine it because Sarah heard it too. Has anyone else ever heard of anything like this? I've asked friends who are avid outdoorsmen, hunters, and trackers, and none of them have ever heard of anything like it. One night, in the spur of the moment, my best friend, my girlfriend, and I went camping on the banks of a creek that I lived within five miles of. We grabbed a 20-pack of beer, some blankets, and some cigarettes, and headed out in my piece-of-shit van with good spirits. It was about a week to ten days before Halloween, so it got dark on us pretty quickly. We made haste and gathered firewood with flashlights, ignited a fire, which rapidly grew hot, and threw off a lot of light, which allowed us to gather enough wood to chill and drink a couple of beers. We broke out the boombox and commenced having a good time. A few hours went by very quickly, and my girlfriend went to the van to sleep, although I don't know how, as it was pretty cold away from the fire. Anyway, my friend's girlfriend got off work at midnight and brought us more beer, though we didn't need it, as we had only drank about half of what we had initially brought. Those two got in an argument and she left. We watched as her taillights faded into the night. Then the weird stuff started happening. This place wasn't in the middle of nowhere. It was secluded, but we could see farmhouses from where we were. It was far enough tucked out and cold enough where nobody would be screwing around anywhere near us. All of a sudden, my buddy goes, screw that woman, and turns up the radio as loud as it would go, but not for long. It was about that time that I heard what he was talking about. A distinct woman's voice from across the creek scream in a guttural way, help me. I looked across the fire at my buddy to see him look as pale and sheepish as I felt. He turned down the radio before I could say anything. Dude, did you hear that? He said. He grabbed his cell phone and we both grabbed flashlights and shined them across the creek. He called his girlfriend to make sure she didn't have car trouble down the road. She was already home. That was like a relief and more stress at the same time. It wasn't her, so who the hell could it be? We stood there in the grip of fear. Lights shined across the water. We didn't hear anything for what seemed like forever. Just when we were about to chalk it up to imagination or jitters or something, we hear, help me. A woman that couldn't have been a hundred yards away from where we were standing, which was right on the opposite bank of the creek from where we were. We quickly shone our lights to where the plea for help was coming from, but there was nothing there. We both called out, hello, where are you? Hello? No response ever came. Being experienced in the outdoors, we both knew that if she was being attacked or chased, there would be other noises we could hear, like rustling in the fallen leaves, or as close as it sounded, some more cries for help or twigs snapping or something. By this time, whatever buzz we had from the beer was long gone. We began gathering whatever we could grab, and I woke up my girlfriend and commanded her to start the van and that we were leaving. She promptly did this, and it's probably a good thing that she did, because what came next still scares me to this day and is completely unexplainable. As we were piling in, we hear, help me, come from the very back of the van, which was in the complete opposite direction of where the screams had been coming from. Needless to say, we left the beer and radio and got out of Dodge. 
I had my girlfriend get out of the way, and I burned out, nearly wrecking the car in the process. I drove the dirt road about 60 all the way out. This happened in October of 2002, and I can't reconcile what it was. I tried saying that it was maybe coyotes or foxes. They make a yipping bark and a really scary scream, respectively. There aren't any mountain lions within 500 miles of this place, so it wasn't that either. But whatever it was spoke, and to my knowledge, none of those things do. Whatever it was, it scared two 21-year-olds into leaving a case of beer behind. Honestly, I don't think I want to know what it was. Although, I think I have a pretty good idea. I was out walking the woods at an ungodly hour of the morning. I believe it was around 1 to 2 in the morning. Last year, I was working at a church youth camp in Wisconsin. The camp was on two sides of a highway, and a tunnel under the highway connected the two sides of the camp, so that the campers could more readily access the other side. My then-girlfriend and our friend liked to walk the woods at night after we were done with work. The first time we had done this, we were scared shitless by a fox barking. The deer in the woods were fairly docile and didn't spook easily. We soon learned to identify the sound of the fox, and we saw it several times. One night, it was just me and my ex-girlfriend walking through the woods. As we rounded a corner in the trail, I noticed movement in the field by the tunnel. Gray shapes. I assumed they were deer, and I pointed them out to my girlfriend. We continued our walk past the tunnel. Just as we passed the entrance to the tunnel, maybe about 20 yards, we heard the most horrendous screeching. It sounded as if somebody was being strangled. It did not sound at all like the fox, but we shrugged it off. We continued up the road. All of a sudden, I had this weird feeling, and I turned around to see a tall figure standing in the road. It was dressed in white, and it was all hazy. I wondered if I was a little too tired and was seeing things, so I poked my girlfriend and asked her to take a look behind us. She immediately noticed it too. Something we both noted was that our eyes kept sliding off the figure. It was like we couldn't keep our vision centered on it. I was thinking this and she voiced it without me saying anything to her. I pulled my hunting knife from its sheath, but I somehow knew that it wouldn't do anything. Without looking away from the thing, I said, let's go, now. We backed away and then started running, and we didn't stop until we were back to the cabins. When I got back inside the cabin, the guy in the bunk next to me was still up texting his girlfriend. I quickly told him what I had seen. He looked at me and said, that's why I don't go out at night. I never went back out into those woods at night again. And when I talk about this, I still get chills and a nervous feeling. We had no drugs or alcohol. We were both under 21, and we were working at a church camp with strict policies. So, I have no idea what we saw. When I, when I was around five, I went camping with my parents in a place called Bear Creek Reservoir in BC. It's a very isolated place, deep in the woods. We got there by driving up an old logging road. The actual reservoir itself was very beautiful and quiet. I actually looked up the area on Google Maps and it still gives me chills, even looking at it from a satellite perspective. But anyway, the day passed by without incident, and we mostly just swam the whole day. We went to bed that night, and nothing unusual had happened. But the following morning, I woke up in my parents' tent just as the sun was making its appearance. I unzipped the tent and noticed a figure standing maybe 50 feet away. The light was still fairly dim, so it was hard to make out distinct details. But it was just standing there, staring at me, unmoving. The entity had the figure of a woman of average size, but instead of seeing a face, there was just darkness. 
Even so, I could tell that it was looking at me. And instead of clothes and skin, it had leaves and sticks, as if it was made from them. I remember feeling very afraid of this creature, like if I left the tent I wouldn't be seen again kind of fear. So I tried waking up my parents, and they were both really pissed that I woke them up, and they didn't believe me at all, until they finally got up later and explored the area. We ended up finding a bunch of man-made structures made of branches and other weird stuff in the area, but not one where I had seen it, so I don't know. Anyway, that's my true story. Let me know what you think. I'd like to go there again someday and see if I can find anything, but maybe it's best I don't. When I was in northern Nova Scotia this last year while camping and fishing, I saw these odd shadow figures in the treetops. Everything was proportional about them, except for their arms. They were just way too long. They appeared just after dusk and they never came near to the ground. They didn't necessarily feel malicious, it just felt bad like I shouldn't do anything that could draw their attention, or else it would have gone badly. Nothing of note happened other than them being there, but I'd never heard of anything like it before. Is anyone aware of any legends or anything describing shadow figures and treetops? I'd love to even have a name for these things, because to this day, I still have no idea what I saw. About two years ago, my husband and I took our five kids to a water theme park in Idaho. We live in Washington State. We borrowed my dad's trailer and truck and thought it would be less expensive and more fun if we camped at a campground down the road rather than the one made for the park. I've driven through Idaho before and so has my husband, but we've never stayed there before. To preface my experience, I have had nightmares on occasion where I felt like something was trying to possess me. I always end up reciting the Lord's Prayer or yelling or something. I'll be honest, sometimes it takes a couple of tries and I always have my husband wake me up because I'm screaming. I regularly pray for protection, wear protective crystals and ask my guardians for protection also. I feel as though because I regularly research and read into the paranormal, it's best to take precautions. So here we are at this campground. The first night, everything was great. Nothing happened. The next day, we take the kids to the park, spend all day there, and come back to cook dinner and get ready for bed. I also must say, while I have read a lot about sleep paralysis, I have never experienced it until this night, and I have not since. Once we were all in bed, I started to fall asleep. While asleep, I feel awake. I can see the trailer around me in kind of what felt like a blur, but I'm unable to shout or scream or move. I look to the end of my bed and see what looks like a short, four foot tall or so demon-like thing. It has horns and it's difficult to make out its face and it's terrifying. All of a sudden, I feel my husband grab my arm and I'm awake. He says, you were screaming, are you okay? I told him I was fine and tried to go back to sleep, but the same thing happened again, except this time the demon was closer to me. I remember shouting in my head, Jesus is my savior, go away, but he wouldn't. I remember trying to scream for my husband, but I couldn't. Then once again, my husband grabs my arm and wakes me up, saying I'm still screaming. At this point, I still told him I was fine. I attempted to sleep once more, and the same thing happened again and again, and every time, the demon thing was even closer. No matter what I tried, he wouldn't leave, and again, my husband would wake me up. Eventually, I told him what was going on. He said he was sorry. 
This time I didn't try to fall back asleep. I wrapped as much of him as I could around me and desperately tried not to sleep. I felt like something was trying to pull me towards sleep, but I fought it. Next thing I know, I woke up the next morning and told my husband the entire story. I have never researched the area. I can't remember the name of the campground. Because I was so terrified, I haven't really shared this story until recently. Where do I begin? This had taken place a few years ago. I was with my best friend, and we decided to go camping at a campsite in Flagstaff named Lockett Meadow. We had taken our dogs, and after a day of hiking and exploration, we played around a fire and eventually went to sleep. I awoke in the middle of the night to find this deep figure outside our tent, burying itself into our tent. It had this weird way of hovering back and forth over my body and my dog, who was curled up, awake, and not moving or making a sound at the bottom of my feet. I look over and I see my best friend passed out and his dog. I'm unsure whether or not his dog was awake, but I was clearly the only one between my friend and I that was, and I'm experiencing this terrifying encounter. I eventually covered my head and thought about anything to make me fall asleep. The next day, I asked my friend if he had somehow been awake through all of that. I explained what happened, and he replied no and thought that I was lying. I told him maybe it was a bear or something, so we looked around our campsite but couldn't find any trace. No trails, no prints, nothing. We also had food out on a table near our tents, and a trash bag hung up on a broken branch. So even if it was a bear, I'm surprised it wouldn't have gotten into any of our food. Either way, I remember how scared I was seeing this dark object observing our tent. I don't know if it was the wind or a deer or a bear, who knows, but this is just one encounter out of the whole camping trip. The next night we decide to camp at Beaver Creek. Mind you, we were in Arizona. Before we settled in, we explored Sedona. We drove to Oak Creek and parked our car near a trail down to the water. We took our dogs and hiked to the creek. After we finished jumping in and swimming, we dried off and were about to head out. Next thing you know, we see from the corner of our eyes a big rock being thrown near us, making this huge splash in the water. We look up and can't see anything above us. So we run over stones and rocks to get a clear view of the top, and we see nobody. We yell out a bunch of foul stuff and heard nobody running off or anything like that. When we got to our next campsite at Beaver Creek and set up there, my friend told me that throughout the trip, since we started in Flagstaff, he's had rocks being thrown at him, even before that big ass rock at Oak Creek. We looked at each other and thought maybe someone was following and messing with us. Then we sort of laughed it off and said that was impossible and that we were just trying to connect dots and have it be a cool adventure. Nothing happened that night and going into the next day where we packed up and headed home with nothing of a memory to be justified by. To this day, I'm still not entirely sure what we encountered. This happened at a school camp when I was about 11 years old. Our school camp was scheduled to be at a campground about two and a half to three hours away. I remember talking to people about the camp and where I was going, and one of my friends who was a year older told me that they saw something like a pair of eyes when they were down at the creek one night. Skip ahead, I can't exactly remember what night this was of the five day camp, but I remember exactly what happened and I always will. We were sitting with the other students and we had just finished eating, meaning it was time to play games and to calm all the kids down. 
My friend Savannah told me that she needed to go down to our tent and change clothes and asked if I would come with her. I said that I would and one of the teachers said that I could go with her. Keep in mind the tents were way away from the rest of camp and it was actually a walk to get to them as it was a huge campground. So we got a torch and walked down to the tents. We got in and left our tent window open for light as it would have been awkward to have the torch on. Stupid, I know, but we were young. We turned around and I started changing too. Then something very bright caught my attention. I looked at the window and there were flashing bright lights everywhere. And I swear there was no way it could have been a camera because there were tons at the window moving so fast. I quickly spun around and in like one second, they were at the door, then vanished. I quickly said to my friend, what was that? And we totally freaked out. We quickly finished getting changed and hurried back to our class and teachers where the teacher had just talked to the class. We had to explain what happened to the teachers. It seems like just a sicko taking photos when you hear the story, but I promise that I know it wasn't a camera. You can take my word for that. There was no way and I've been around cameras modeling and stuff, so I know what all the camera flashes are like. I don't know what I saw that night, and I don't think I ever will, but I know that I will remember that night for the rest of my life. A few years ago, my mom and I decided to take a road trip. We were going to different camping and hiking spots along the California coast, and we were in the Big Sur area at the time of this particular incident. It was getting to be later in the day, so we had sort of been scrambling to find a campsite to sleep at. I can't remember the exact details, but for some reason we ended up going to this long, windy mountain road that seemed to go up forever. Eventually at the top, we found this secluded site with camp spots and even a bathroom. We didn't see anyone around, but the sun was about to go down, so we figured we could find the person in charge in the morning and pay them then. By now it was dark and we had been around the fire for a few hours. Our site was right at the edge of the trees. I heard some rustling coming from that direction and I looked up. Two people were walking one in front of the other dressed in all white, perfectly clean clothes. The person in front had their arm back to hold the other's hand, but they both looked straight ahead and they didn't acknowledge my mom or I whatsoever. They walked out of the woods, past us, and then right back into the trees. Here's what's weird. Neither of them had lights. They were totally barefoot, had no belongings with them, and were not dressed warmly. It was probably around 40 degrees, pitch dark and rough terrain. Not to mention the gut-wrenching, heart-dropping feeling I got when I saw them. I asked my mom if she saw that and she said no, even though she was facing the same direction as me. I was on edge the rest of the night and had trouble sleeping. In the morning, my mom found the camp owner, paid him and told him what I said I'd seen. He replied nonchalantly, oh yeah, those are the night walkers. People see them around here sometimes. When she asked him if he thought they were paranormal, he said, pretty damn sure. We got the hell out of there as soon as we could. This is my story of a dude I happened to come across in the deep woods in Florida. This was in Ocala National Forest. I probably came across either a poacher's camp or a drug operation, and they put signs up to scare people away. In any case, my friend and I were hunting and stayed out past midnight looking for hogs. We realized we were way deeper into the woods than we had planned on being, and we began to walk out. We were probably three or four miles into the woods, off the main road. 
We were walking in the dark, heavily armed with AR-15s, sidearms, and fixed blade hunting knives in a hip sheath. So we really weren't afraid of anything. Plus, the moon was bright enough to navigate by, even under the trees. We had lights mounted on our rifles, and I had a large, powerful flashlight in my hand that I could make into a strobe or use as a club. The point is, we weren't paranoid of anything. We felt very prepared. We were heading back, and we started to hear something hauling through the woods on our right. It was about to cross the trail in front of us. Most trails are old logging roads. They're pretty wide, and they make square quadrants out of the forest. This particular trail cut across one of the quadrants and was overgrown and thin. We thought it was a deer or maybe a black bear. Either way, we couldn't shoot it at night. So instead of using the rifle lights, I used my handheld light. We waited until we heard it get near the trail, and then I turned my light on. All we saw was a pair of white legs cross the thin trail about 50 feet in front of us. They looked human. We were a little baffled, like what moron goes crashing through the deep woods at 1 a.m. in shorts and through the thick brush, not the trail. Super weird. But again, and armed as we were for hogs, we pushed on because it would have taken like 30 minutes extra to turn back and go around the quadrant. We hear crashing now and then in the woods, but it never got close to us again. Finally, we reached my car, and I was relieved that it was still there and not broken into. We keep the rifles loaded, shove our handguns between the seat and the center console, and get into the front seat. I begin to drive out of the forest with my moonroof open, and the stars were just gorgeous. It's easy to forget how amazing the night sky is in the middle of Ocala. About half a mile down the road, my headlights fall onto a man in a checkered button-down shirt and shorts, just walking along the road. We're miles from any paved road, and then it's another five to 10 miles on the paved road to get to a town. Also, this is in the northern part of the forest, where there are no old cabins that were built before it was declared a national park. This dude had no backpack or anything. Was this what we saw across the path? If so, what was he doing walking out here at 1.30 to 2 in the morning with no supplies, no flashlight, nothing? He didn't even look at us as we passed. Anyway, as we got near the paved road, we unloaded the rifles and put them in the trunk and went home. It was a really fun trip, and I can't wait to go back, but I will always be armed in Ocala. Something seriously weird is going on out there. Given that this happened in the middle of the woods at night in the Pacific Northwest, as well as the fact that I was a child when it happened, I understand that this could be almost anything. However, even at 23, recalling this moment still brings tears to my eyes and cold chills down my back. I was about 10 years old and it had to have been around 11 p.m. I was at a horse camp in Battleground, Washington and I was the only person awake in my cabin. I heard this sound far off in the distance. It sounded like a horse whinnying, which makes sense. Only it didn't stop. It was one long whinny that kept going. After about six to seven seconds, the pitch grew lower and lower until it turned into this god-awful, low guttural scream. It went on for probably about 30 seconds with no pause. I know 30 seconds seems short, but when you're sitting there as a child with nothing between you and it but a screen door, it feels like ages. I never heard that sound again after that, and I know it's a very short story, but even now when I tell this story, it brings tears to my eyes. Other than Bigfoot, because I'm sure it's not that, is there any folklore pertaining to the Pacific Northwest that could account for this sound? I don't know of anything that starts out as a horse whinny, never stops, 
and ends up in a demonic growling scream. I would love to know what it was that I experienced. Maybe I won't be so afraid of it anymore. A few months ago, three other friends and I went out to camp near a lake. We went camping on the shore of the lake, right next to a forest that went up a hill. It was nighttime, and the sky was very clear. We had a fire going, and so one friend and I decided to go a bit farther near to the lake to look at the stars. You could see the Milky Way and everything. It was really cool. While we were there, we were talking a little bit, and I noticed a light in the forest above where the other two friends were, and above where we were camping. It was really bright in the middle, like a white orb, and at first I thought it was a person with a flashlight. The next thing I know, it zipped in a straight line, super fast, then went back again, with the same speed. Then, instantly, it just disappeared. My other friend who was with me saw it, and we both got really freaked out. He is very religious and can't explain it to me, but still doesn't want to believe that it's anything paranormal. So I'm kind of alone in this. The other friends didn't see anything, because it was behind them. I have no idea what it could have been. The weird thing was that it was at the moment we noticed it, that it reacted and moved around and disappeared. I wonder if it had been there the whole time while we were camping. There would have been no way to see it. Only when we moved away and then faced toward our camp could we have seen it. I told my other friends about it and they thought I was just joking. And the friend who was with me and saw it doesn't want to talk about it. So I don't really have any good answers. For the rest of the camping trip, I felt really uneasy. This happened to me a while back when I decided to go on another camping trip alone. I always liked camping alone. There's something serene and sobering about being isolated in the middle of the wilderness, and I always found it relaxing. So I planned out what trail I was going to take, packed my camping gear and my rifle for protection, and jumped in the truck. I get to this trail early in the morning and I hike about 15 to 20 miles in until I find the right spot. I head off the trail to find a place to put my tent up. I stumble upon this nice sized clearing and decide that it's a nice, beautiful spot to settle down. I am exhausted at this point, but I set up the tent at the southernmost edge of the clearing next to the tree line, and I manage to get a fire going. I roast some hot dogs and start to hear a sound in the distance beneath all the forest noise. It sounded like an animal, mostly like a deer, with a lame leg because it sounded like the animal was making a walking, dragging noise. I felt bad for the poor guy, but it was too far away and it was getting dark, so I couldn't really go find it to put it out of its misery. I think nothing else about it after that and I go on eating my food. After I eat, I douse the fire and crawl into my tent and get into my sleeping bag. I decide that even at my exhausted and relaxed state, I can't go to sleep. So I pull out a book that I brought with me and start to read by the light of my lamp. Hours go by and I hear that sound again, this time closer, right at the opposite side of the clearing. Surprised, I put my book down and listen to this animal walk drag across the clearing toward my tent. It's really loud at this point, and it now sounds like the hooves are all being heavily planted, with dragging noises following seconds after, almost like the deer is dragging something along. It makes it to about what I assume is the middle of the clearing, and stops. I hear nothing. No breathing. I mean, not a sound from this animal. 
I unzip the tent and I look into the clearing. Nothing but trees and darkness. What the hell? Unnerved at this point, I zip the tent back up and I sit there listening for other noises. Nothing. Just the crickets and the breeze. I decide that there are a lot of strange noises in the woods and just tried not to let it bother me. Besides, I had my rifle. I start to doze off when I hear men's laughter off in the distance to my right, then women's laughter and stick snapping far off to my left. I'm up now, wondering if what I'm hearing is really what I'm hearing, or if it's just the product of being half asleep. I hear more faint laughing from a couple of other different directions. All different. Old men, old women, younger adults, even children. And I confirm that it's real. The noises are closing in. So I grab my rifle, preparing to fire off a warning shot into the air in case they came too close. Something about this laughter, how far in I was, the noise earlier and the time of night, told me that this was not just another family strolling through. I was on edge enough already, but then I noticed something. The nightlife was dead quiet. Not even the wind was making any noise. I decided that enough was enough. I unzipped the tent and fired a single shot into the night. I sat there and surveyed the tree line and saw nothing. I listened intently to my surroundings, no laughing, and the forest sounds had returned. Relaxing just a bit and figuring that I had scared whoever was there off, I sat down and in my exhausted state, I fell asleep. I woke up later in a cold sweat, racked with anxiety, and it was still dark outside. I immediately hear two people whispering not far from my tent. Alert, I grabbed my rifle and tried to listen to what they were saying. I couldn't make out much, but I heard something about being lost. So I shouted, hey, who's there? The voices fall silent. I shout again, are you guys lost? Who's there? Suddenly a huge burst of flame, like a flamethrower, erupted from the middle of the clearing illuminating several silhouettes of people just standing around. In shock, I fire my rifle, blowing a hole in the front of my tent, and it goes dark. Without checking my surroundings, I get up and sprint out of my tent, making a hard left back to where the trail was. I hiked until sunrise back to my truck, with my head over my shoulder the entire way. I never heard anybody following me. I never saw anyone or anything the whole way, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. After that, my enjoyment of camping alone left me like I left all my gear in the woods that night, and I've never done it since. The summer after my second year in high school, I went up to Pike National Forest in Colorado for a summer field biology camp. It was pretty cool because I'd never been camping prior. I had a small two-man tent that I shared with my buddy from school. We had met this kid at camp and instantly became really good friends. His parents were loaded and his tent, which was about 10 feet from us, was huge, like a 10-person tent. The night before this incident, a huge windstorm blew through the valley and absolutely annihilated his huge tent. Mine was fine because it was low to the ground. Anyway, for the rest of the time, he slept in our already packed tent. I slept closest to the door of the tent because I always had to pee in the middle of the night and I didn't want to have to climb over people. So the night this all went down, I woke up, no idea what time it was, went outside to the forest, peed, and crawled back into the tent. I was laying there for a bit, and there happened to be a lightning storm overhead, cloud to cloud. As I was watching the light illuminate my tent, I started hearing whispering. It was female whispering, 
back and forth. I tried to hear what it was saying, but it was unintelligible. The whispering started to get closer and closer until it was right next to the tent by my right ear. It just stopped. I didn't hear anyone walking or anything like that. Then all of a sudden, lightning lit up the tent and there were shadows of people cast onto the side of the tent. That's when the chanting began. It sounded like a different language, all female voices and a bunch of them. I just closed my eyes and slipped under my sleeping bag, terrified, and put my hands over my ears. The next day after breakfast, we all went back to the tent to get changed, and the new guy who was now staying with us says, pretty wild last night, right? To which I responded, you mean the lightning? He said, no, the frickin' scary chanting. I think this place is cursed or something. So it wasn't just me. But it did help that someone else had heard it and we could talk about it. Now, every time I go camping, I stop drinking anything two hours before I plan to sleep so that I don't have to wake up in the middle of the night to pee because I am not going out there. This happened on a cliff overlooking the ocean. My family and I were camping on a site close to the edge. And one day during our stay, we all started hearing this guttural howling noise coming from the cliffs. It was like nothing I had ever heard before. We were curious, so we took the long walk to the cliff to see if we could identify the source. As we got closer, it got louder and louder until it was drowning out any other sound. We could barely hear each other when we were yelling to each other. The sound seemed to be traveling up the cliffs from the beach below, but it was like a mixture between what I would describe as a mechanical sound and some giant thing roaring in anguish. We all had inexplicable feelings of dread and we booked it out of there as fast as we could. The noise did not get quieter as we descended back to our tent. It stayed at its deafening volume. The strangest thing was that no one around us could hear it. We asked and observed people through the day and night to see if they reacted or looked curiously, but nothing. We were the only ones who could hear it, and that was impossible considering how loud this thing was. The volume made the ground feel like it was shaking. It was one of the strangest things that we've all experienced. I don't know if it was some kind of mass delusion or something like that, but it was definitely wild. These events occurred two summers ago in the Grand Teton area. My boyfriend at the time, now husband, let's call him Harry, was an avid outdoorsman and also served in the military. I was an ecology major and wanted to spend more time outdoors. So he decided to take me on my first backpacking trip, just the two of us. For those who aren't familiar, the Grand Tetons are well known for their wildlife specifically grizzly bears. My only experience with bears up to this point was watching a little black bear cross the road from the safety of my car. Seeing grizzly country signs around every corner wasn't doing much to calm my nerves. The first incident. My boyfriend looked like Indiana Jones, machete hanging from his belt large knives attached to each side of his pack, bear spray strapped to his waist. You get the picture. The beginning of our 25 mile journey was all uphill. When in bear country, you're supposed to make noise so as to not startle the wildlife by accidentally sneaking up on it. As you can imagine, going up a steep hill while carrying a 40 pound pack 
makes it a little difficult to make conversation. We were an hour in and almost at the top of the ascent. I noticed that the woods had gone completely silent, save for the rushing stream that was to our left of the trail. Silent woods are never a good sign. This usually indicates that predators are nearby. At this point, I was in front of my boyfriend and we were about to crest the hill. For the past 20 minutes, we hadn't said a word to each other, having been too tired to speak. We noticed the silence at the same time and gave each other knowing glances. I came up over the top of the hill and immediately froze. Sitting not 10 feet in front of me in the middle of the trail was a grizzly bear. My husband wasn't aware yet as he was behind me, so I did the first thing I could think of. While still in my frozen stance, I managed to take my arm and start flinging it wildly behind me, trying to get Harry's attention. I was too terrified to speak. The bear went from sitting to all fours, not looking away from us once. Harry quickly swung me around so that I was behind him, and he just started yelling. Being in the military, he knows how to yell. The grizzly wasn't quite phased as it started to walk slowly toward us. At this point, I was on the verge of passing out from terror. This bear was about five feet in front of us when we heard a loud crack coming from the woods to our right. The bear heard it too and he bolted toward the stream. A second crack boomed again, this time much closer than before. My boyfriend said, it's probably just some falling branches, but we both knew that wasn't the case. At this point, we were walking quickly up the trail in an attempt to create some distance from the grizzly and those strange noises. I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand straight up, and at the same moment, my boyfriend stopped moving in front of me. He turned around to look at me, and I turned around to look behind me. To this day, we're not sure what we saw. Back where we had been standing was a large black-brown mass. It looked to be three times bigger than the already large grizzly that we had seen just a few moments before. Its back was facing us, and then it stood on its hind legs. It looked similar to a bear, but something about the shape was just off. At this point, it was probably stupid to run away, but that is exactly what we did. We were aware of heavy footsteps behind us, but neither of us looked back. The footsteps eventually faded. At this point, I was a mess. My boyfriend was doing his best to console me. Honey, this is extremely unusual. The bears usually stay away from humans. We're going to be okay. I'm sure that won't happen again. That was enough to convince me to continue on the backpack. Not another hour later though, we reached a clearing where we decided to take a rest and have a snack. About a minute after we had sat down, I noticed bushes moving in a line toward the clearing, toward us. Out of the brush comes this adolescent grizzly who looks just as spooked as I'm sure we did, but he came straight for us. My husband, being the crazy nut that he is, decided to charge back at the bear while screaming, bear spray at the ready. That did the trick and the bear ran off. All I could think was just my luck, but that wasn't even close to what happened the second night. Night two. Before we began our backpack, we had to let the ranger station know which trails and route we planned to take. With this information, they usually send a ranger on horseback at some point during the backpack to check on you, just to make sure everything is okay. 
There weren't many approved trails left for us to choose from, and it was just our luck that they were the most difficult. Apparently, over the three days that we were on those trails, we had been the sole hikers. We didn't see a single other person once we were en route. However, I guess we missed the ranger who came to check on us. We had been following hoof prints the entire second day, and we hadn't seen any the day before. I had some foot problems, so we spent valuable daylight trying to adjust my boots, laces, and socks to compensate for the pain. When we started on the trail again, we had maybe an hour or two of daylight left, and in the woods, it gets dark fast. I was exhausted. It was now dark out, and Harry was the only one with a working headlamp, as mine wouldn't even turn on for some reason. We needed to find somewhere to set up camp, as we still needed to eat. It was freezing, and the wind was blowing. It was creating a howling sound as it rushed through the trees, which made it difficult to hear Harry or discern any other sounds coming from the woods. After another hour of hiking through the dark, we found a clearing. Well, it was more like a bowl. It looked to be about 200 meters in diameter, with the sides being about 10 meters down from the trail to the bottom of the clearing. This place was strange. We both felt it, though he didn't tell me how freaked he was until after we had left. There was no moonlight, so all we had was the illumination from his headlamp, our small camp stove, and the flashlight that I had fished from my pack. Half of the trees were dead or fallen, but just in the bowl. The vegetation everywhere else was very dense. To help alleviate my anxiousness, he started playing some music out of his portable speaker. This didn't help much, as it just echoed off the trees, creating a dissonance of sounds. He also thought that it would ward off any predators nearby. This is when we knew our anxiety was not paranoia. The silence was back. There hadn't been a single bird chirp since we arrived at the clearing. It also may have had to do with the obnoxious music, but because of our previous experience, we decided to turn off the music and head into the tent. Aside from everything else, it was freezing. As soon as we were situated in our sleeping bags, we heard deep cracks and thuds echoing from beyond the tree line. Falling trees? There had been a lot of wildfires and very little rain this season. Thud. We both froze. That sound wasn't an echo. It came from inside the clearing, and it was definitely not a falling tree. Thud. It came from right outside our tent. We both stopped breathing. Harry's hand found mine, and we clung to each other, paralyzed. Something dragged across the outside of our tent, making an indent as it went along. It was thin, almost like a finger. What is it? I whispered, shaking. I don't know. It shouldn't be a person. We're the only ones on this side of the mountain. I was trying my hardest to stifle sobs, trying to listen to what was outside. I could hear steps, but I couldn't decipher what it was. The steps stopped. And then, the whole side of the tent was slowly pushed inward. At this point, whatever was outside knew we were inside, so I shined my flashlight at the side of the tent. What I saw made my blood run cold. Pressed into the tent wall was the shape of a human face. I could make out the nose an open mouth. Each time they breathed, it made the tent around their mouth billow in and out. Harry said, F that, 
and pulled a Glock from his sleeping bag. He cocked it, and the sound shattered the silence. The face pulled back, and we heard fast footsteps heading toward the edge of the clearing. We didn't leave the tent till the sun was shining the next morning. The first thing we noticed was the smell of urine. We came out of the tent and looked around. Whoever it was had peed on our coals that we had left on the fire, leaving a disgusting stench of evaporated pee. Footprints surrounded our tent, circling around it multiple times. Muddy handprints decorated the outside of our tent. At least, we think it was mud. The takeaway? Wildlife is not the most dangerous thing in the backcountry. telling this story for 80% entertainment value and 20% feedback. This is entirely true. I'm not a spiritual person. I'm resistant to energies and vibes, though I do believe that there are others who are more tapped into their surroundings than I am in that regard. And I'm a cynic with most paranormal things, except Bigfoot. I believe in the Squatch, but we ain't talking about him. I live in the foothills of Western North Carolina, near the base of the Blue Ridge. I lived in the mountains for a few years and hated it up there. I despise the woods with a burning passion. Yet, just my luck, I've moved back in with my folks, in their cabin, surrounded by woods. The land my family owns stretches across about 15 acres of woodland. Now. These are the woods I grew up in. Despite my typical aversion to nature, I do feel pretty safe in them. I climbed the trees and splashed in the creek and played with stick swords when I was a kid. These woods are home, except for the area behind the backyard. Our cabin is positioned at the top of a pretty steep hill that slopes down for about a half mile before it bottoms out at a creek down in the woods. The halfway point between the house and the creek is this little patch of woods right behind the fenced in area around the house. It's always in shade, no thick undergrowth, just trees, Carolina red clay, piles of leaves, the usual, but it feels really weird down there in a way that I can't explain. I feel very unwelcome out behind the house, and I'm not the only one. My parents avoid it too. Even our pets, past and present, have always steered clear of it. I'm going to list some experiences that might get my point across better. A. I was about eight or nine, and one summer, I thought I'd try camping in the backyard. I set up my family's unused tent, loaded it up with an air mattress and a pile of blankets, copper, my beloved deer stuffy, and some comic books. I guess I wanted to be excited about it, but even before the sun went down, when my mom was helping me set up my little camping trip, I felt uneasy. The shady patch of woods around the backyard was just weird, but I was a kid, so I figured, screw it, I'm 20 feet from the house, I'll be fine. I was not fine. I got set up for the night, stayed up reading comics, felt like an outdoorsman, and it had barely gotten dark when I began hearing loud, rhythmic crunching in the woods behind the backyard, like something big was walking in circles around the undergrowth. We don't have bears in my neck of the woods. Besides, whatever it was, it was definitely walking on two legs. It never tried to approach the backyard, even as I sat there with copper, just listening to it. It just kept walking. 
I barely lasted an hour in that tent before running inside and getting into my own bed. B. My mom is an avid gardener and decided that she was going to put together four or five raised gardening beds in the backyard for herbs and veggies. This was when I was 11-ish, so naturally I was roped in to help. We spent the first part of the spring putting them together and getting them started. I began noticing that both of us would get really edgy and irritable back there. We're best friends and we never fight, but we would be snapping at each other, constantly raising that stupid garden. I also noticed for the first time that the woods behind the house are deathly quiet. Playing music or talking didn't make any difference. It was that kind of silence that presses in on you. And it's always like that back there. The beds actually thrived for a little while, but mom would always ask me to come with her when she tended to them. I thought it was silly at the time. When I got older though, she told me she just couldn't be down there by herself. She'd wait until I was home from school before checking on them because she too felt uneasy and unwelcome. Eventually, we just abandoned the project. The raised beds are still down there, by the way, just rotting away in the undergrowth. I haven't checked on them since middle school and I'm 23 now. C. Lastly, and in my opinion, the creepiest, was the time that I asked mom to cut my hair. We were poorer then, so rather than go to a salon, mom just gave me a twice monthly trim. It was late spring and warm, so she suggested we cut it in the backyard for easier cleanup. I was maybe 13 or 14 at this point. So we ventured down, I brought a stool, and I sat diligently while she cut my hair. Side note, my mom has always cut my hair, so she's very good at it. She doesn't make mistakes. This is important. As she worked and we talked, I noticed that the old familiar feeling of unease was back. We were not welcome back there. The tree stood still and shadowy despite the brilliant sunny day. And I remember that it was cold, very cold. Mom finished up my haircut and I shook off the extra debris to let her admire her handiwork. She stepped around in front of me, angled my head this way and that, and said it looked good. Three things happened then in very quick succession. First, I felt this squeeze of pressure on my lungs, like I couldn't breathe. It was such a weird sensation that I just froze. All of the uneasiness of the atmosphere pressed in on me all at once. Second, my mom got this weird, vacant look on her face. I remember her smile fading and her eyes going a little glassy, like she was lost in thought. And then she reached out with the scissors, still making this empty expression and snipped a deep cut into the skin over my left eye. I freaked out, jumped down off the stool, and backed away. At that same time, the third thing happened. She seemed to gather herself again. She was almost in tears. She apologized over and over again. We didn't even bother to take anything with us as we ran back up to the house to treat the cut and stop the bleeding. I still have a little scar there and she's never forgiven herself for it. There wasn't even a hair hanging over that eye either. I had a pixie cut at the time. So, yeah, a few of the many weird experiences that make me avoid the backyard now. I haven't even been down there in seven or eight years, but now that I'm living here again, I just sometimes look into the backyard and feel that weird shudder of apprehension. So what's the deal? Why don't we feel welcome in a 50 square foot patch of land that we own? Why is it so dark and quiet all the time? I have no idea, 
but my parents and I, we just work around it and pretend it isn't there. When I was young, I attended the local scout group based in my village in Hampshire. The amount of things that I learned from scouts and the lessons that it taught me are innumerable, but one particular memory stands out. Once on a camp at an old scouting campsite, I remember we were playing a game at night, which was World War II themed. Our leader loved creating military themed games. In this game, each team had a bomb, a colored string of wool, that they had to fix to the enemy base, which was a random piece of rope that was put up in the woods, making sure not to get caught by the enemy soldiers, which were the leaders carrying flashlights. As somewhat of a tactician, I departed from the other scouts, who were heading straight down the main path toward the enemy base, and also toward the leaders. Instead, opting to flank around deep into the woods, which took longer, but proved to be more successful in the dark. Eventually, deep in the woods and on my way to another bombing run, I heard the distant sound of the whistle. This signaled that the game was over and that everyone should return to the camp. I began making a leisurely stroll back through the darkness. I can't remember if I was alerted by sight or by sound, but my attention was drawn to a short silhouette walking through the woods about six to eight meters away. Assuming that this was one of the younger scouts who was also returning to camp, I decided that it would be funny to try and scare them by making growling noises. Immediately after making the noises, the silhouette stopped dead in its tracks, turning toward me. In the darkness, I couldn't make out any of their clothes or features, but I could clearly see the blacked out silhouette of a child. After the figure had clearly noticed me, but not made a sound, I decided to carry on making growling noises. But then the silhouette just turned around and began to walk away from me. They were clearly unfazed by my attempt to scare them. So I figured that I would just follow them back to camp. However, after a few steps, the figure literally face planted into the ground, still about eight meters in front. I jogged a bit to catch up with them and make sure they were okay. But upon reaching where they were, there was no trace of anyone. Confused, I looked around for a short while, seeing if they had scrambled off. But there was no noise of someone running away, and I didn't notice them get up. They had just vanished. Still in a state of confusion, I continued to walk back to the camp alone. I didn't really tell anyone until years later when it clicked in my brain that things just didn't add up. Something else that sticks in my memory from that camp, which is probably unrelated but still strange, was that part of the woods had been cut down and the grounds heavily churned up by some sort of heavy duty machine. Whilst exploring this area, some of my friends and I found an old leather briefcase that looked like it had been churned up by whatever machine had been in the area. Upon opening the briefcase, we found a really old scouting uniform, think sand colored and military style with shoulder lapels, with quite a few loose badges and some other personal items that I can't remember. I don't know if it was related to the boy or not, but it's still kind of strange. Before I tell you my stories, it might be helpful to tell you more about my background. I'm a 23-year-old boy whose family moved during the Yugoslavian War in 1999 from Eastern Serbia to Switzerland. We used to live in a small village across the Danube at the Bulgarian and Romanian border, a region that has a very colorful history. Many bloody historic events occurred on the soil where we lived. Roman emperors used to rule this area as well as many historical figures, such as Attila the Hun, Alexander the Great, 
or Vlad the Impaler, all of which resided here once and fought battles. The region has been occupied many times. The longest used to be under the Ottomans. This occupation lasted for almost three centuries. After the Ottoman occupation, the country didn't have much time to recover, and the First and Second World War had struck the country already. Many people died during the First World War, about a third of the population. As a result, guerrilla groups like Setniks, Partisans, etc. were formed, killing even more people. In conclusion, many people were unjustifiably tortured and lost their lives, which is probably why there are many occurrences of the paranormal here. Magic is also very common here. The so-called Vlak Magic or Vlaska Magica in Valation is said to be one of the strongest in the world, and many people tend to practice it and religiously believe in it. As a result, there are many stories about paranormal events. One of my favorite ones is a story my grandfather told me. He grew up in the forest in a small and old house about 300 years old. He was adopted by my great-grandfather, who used to be a leader in one of the upcoming resistance movements against the socialist regime after the Second World War. He fought in both world wars and, even with all this, he took great care of my grandfather and loved him as if he was his own child. Fifty years passed since he left his home, and all of those people living here died, but my grandpa still visits this house and stays overnight there. This place creeps me out. Even during the day, there's an aura to this place that just makes it uncomfortable to be there. I can't imagine staying there overnight, but he frequently does, and one day he told me a very strange story. While he stays there, he says he often gets visited. At first, I thought visit like the ones you get from neighbors or something, but he told me that one night he woke up to a hand crawling over his head. It was a huge, white, pale man kneeling next to him and sort of crawling over his head, speaking with a calm voice in Vlaski, the dying language that we used to speak here, which is a mix of Moldavian and Romanian. He told me that his skin was white and that it was glowing in the night. He didn't have any hair and the hand felt very soft. My grandfather has always respected the dead and was never really afraid. He told me that he didn't really speak to him and just enjoyed his company, since he knew in some way that he wasn't evil. Another time, he told me that he used to fix small parts around the house. When it started to get dark, he slowly began getting ready to leave his tractor, because it takes like an hour to reach the next civilized place. While putting stuff back into the barn, he heard loud noises in the attic. It didn't bother him, until a plank was thrown down the stairs. He recalled one time they even threw down a rock into the wheelbarrow that he was pushing into the barn. He told me he just turned around, locked the barn, and didn't even frown. They expect you to react, he said. Don't give them this pleasure. He told me this while laughing, then said, it makes them go crazy. Growing up, I heard a lot of these stories, and it really does run in our family, having these experiences from time to time. The scariest thing that happened to me occurred during the summer of 2009. My grandfather told me during this summer break, as usual, stories from the past, of how he used to walk these woods alone in the dark, and what he experienced while doing so. And since I was in my teen years, I started to question the reliability of his stories. From time to time, I took out my old motor bicycle and drove it out into the forest. Driving around was the only time I could really think about stuff and, you know, be in this type of state where you question everything and think about the world. So one day, I took out my bike and decided to drive around. I still don't know why or how, but somehow, I found myself driving to the old house that he grew up in. I didn't really bother to question why my intention was to drive there, so I just kept going. I always believed that I was a kid, pure by hearth, and no evil could ever come to me. While I was driving out, I thought about the probabilities of actually encountering a vampire. 
I live, as I mentioned, in East Serbia where vampires are still widely believed in. My grandpa always told me not to go out past dark, but I didn't really care, so I still kept going. Remembering back, I thought that his intention was to keep me scared so I didn't get lost in the woods. But being a teenager at the time, I thought I was invincible. And in fact, even if a vampire did cross my path, that I would pass by him with no harm. There aren't really streets there, it's just a dirt road between trees that leads to what seems like nothing. After an hour, even the dirt road started to vanish. While I was driving and thinking about how strong I was, I noticed that my hand felt very wet. I thought it was because I was sweating, since this region can get very hot. After taking a look at my hand, I saw that there was blood all over it. At first I thought it might have been a bug that I had squished, but there was just too much blood for that. So I started to look for wounds, but my hand seemed perfectly fine. My heart slowly began racing, and I took a sharp turn and drove back home. I remember this to be the moment that I was the most scared in my life. I had the urge to look behind me every second that I was driving through the forest. It felt like someone was sitting behind me just waiting for me to fall down. After arriving home and telling my grandpa, he just started laughing and told me never to question their abilities again. Everything happened this summer when I was working and living in the Chicago area. I don't know much about spirits or paranormal events, so I'll give you the facts of what happened and you can come to your own conclusions. In the first few weeks of my new job, I met this really great guy. We'll call him Paul. We hit it off immediately, and one day he suggested that we go hiking in the woods. I'm originally from Russia, so I was practically raised in the woods. I spent half of my childhood in them, and I was really excited about his proposal. As we're hiking, it starts raining, like pouring rain. I've never seen anything like it. We go deeper and deeper into the forest until there are no more paths, and we're practically treading swamp water. All this time, we're just talking about random stuff and getting to know each other while not really paying attention to the surroundings. There's no one around since we've gone pretty deep into the woods already and it was pouring buckets. Eventually, we stumble on the skeleton of a teepee, just the bare wooden structure of it, and thought that it was pretty cool. So we kept going in that direction. Suddenly, we both hear someone crying. It sounded like a baby. It is a forest, so lots of animals can imitate that sound, like deer, cubs, etc. And the cry sounded distant anyway, so we thought nothing of it and walked forward. Within seconds, we heard this thing right next to us, which seemed strange since it sounded so far away at first. It was so loud now that it could have been a few feet away. We start looking all around even looking up into the trees, and absolutely nothing was there. It was a pretty weird situation, so we kind of speed walked in the other direction. As soon as we stopped for a break, the sound starts up right next to us again. It was like something was telling us to book it, so we did. We ran faster than what was probably safe in that kind of weather, half looking at Google Maps and half relying on memory we made it back to the entrance of the woods. Both of us agreed that what happened was pretty weird and decided to look into the history of the place. Immediately websites like Most Haunted Forests in Illinois started to pop up. Turns out that the place was the site of ancient Native American burial grounds. Not surprising since a lot of tribes used to live in various parts of Illinois. And apparently, it's where three young boys were brutally murdered and left naked in a ditch. Pretty dark stuff. Paul and I went back and I kind of forgot about the incident, 
until one evening after work, he tells me that he can't stop thinking about the cry and he wants to go back to see what was there. Naturally, I think it's a stupid idea, especially because it was already dark out. But then Paul's friend Ryan joins him for kicks. And since I'm worried for both of their safety, 20 something fresh out of college dudes can be very dumb. I come along thinking that at least I could try to keep them out of trouble. So we hop in the car and we drive over there. Traffic is insane and my friend takes a wrong turn. So we get there at around 11 PM. We get out and head into the forest. Now there's no street lights anywhere near us except right at the edge of the road and flashlights can only do so much. So our visibility is pretty bad. We eventually get to a small wooden bridge that leads us across the river into the actually deep part of the forest. As soon as we cross, I start feeling uneasy. We weren't supposed to be in the woods that late in the first place, but this was a deeper feeling of guilt, like we were intruding or disturbing something that was there. Ryan, who's been leading the way and feeling all confident and cocky, saying that there's nothing out here, stops all of a sudden. On the other side of the bridge, the three of us were hit with this feeling of dread and panic, one that I've never felt before in any forest, and I've been to lots, both in the day and at night. We all exchange nervous looks, and suddenly, we hear crunching coming toward us from the dark. The feeling at this point gets so intense that Ryan, confidently walking ahead seconds ago, now looks uneasy and says, I think we should go back. We all slowly turn around and start speed walking toward the bridge. No one talks until we get to the other side. And Ryan says, I, I was just nervous because, you know, it might have been a homeless person and I didn't want to deal with that. Right. Eventually, we get to the road where our car was parked along the side. And that's when I see a girl, maybe in her early 20s, just walking along the highway. She was wearing very little clothing and looked a little strange. Her walk wasn't a drunk one. She just seemed to be almost, I don't know the right word for it, but vibrating, undulating, I'm not sure. But there wasn't a building around for miles, just straight road. My stepdad is Malaysian and he's told me a bunch of ghost stories about young ghost women on the side of the road killing drivers. But I was willing to risk it because I didn't want to leave this girl all alone, ghost or no ghost. So I convinced Paul to slow down a bit when we got to her. I called out to her from the passenger window, asking if she needed help. The girl slowly turns around and with the creepiest, slowest smile spreading across her lips, she nods. I was hit with that same feeling that I had gotten back there in the forest and almost regretted slowing down. But whatever, my sense of wanting to help that girl was greater than whatever weird stuff I was feeling. And if I died, well, at least I'd have a clean conscience. She gets in the back of the car, right behind my seat and next to Ryan, and he just starts to chat her up, flirting, asking her where she's from and what she's doing. Typical. All this time, I'm turned halfway around keeping an eye on her because I feel like as soon as I turn around and face the road, something bad is going to happen. She's keeping steady eye contact with me the entire time, even when Ryan is talking to her, with that slow, creepy smile, while slightly undulating, I still don't know what to call it, but it seemed snake-like. Ryan asks her where she's coming from, and she says, oh, just around. He asks if she's coming from a bar and she nods her head yes, except there's not a single bar anywhere even close, not for miles and miles. She said she was walking home and gives Paul an address, which is 15 minutes away by car along nothing but forest. My eyes literally hurt from keeping eye contact with her and she just keeps smiling and undulating and giving off this feeling of dread this feeling just keeps increasing. So eventually, we drop her off at her street. There are lots of old looking smaller houses there. When I turn back to look at her a second later, 
she's completely gone. I couldn't sleep that night. I kept imagining her creeping up the stairs, her smiling face undulating from the shadows. About three years ago, I was on a family vacation to Eastern Washington, and a central aspect of our trip was visiting Lake Paragon State Park. It's an extremely rural area with a tiny Western town about a mile away, and that's about it for miles. Anyway, we had just arrived for our 10 day stay in the afternoon, and it was now around 11 PM. My mom and I left our hotel to go down to the park as she was really into photography and the moon was full. If you're not familiar, Eastern Washington as a whole is pretty desolate. So the night sky is generally incredible with very little light pollution. There were no clouds to be seen and we were a ways down a dirt back road over the park above the campground with no real roads anywhere in sight. We got out of the car and took some pictures with nothing more unusual than the eerie silence. About 15 minutes into our visit, we're both facing away from the moon, looking at the rolling hills. And we noticed this odd concentration of light on one hillside, about a quarter mile away. Before either one of us could point it out to the other, the mass of light shining on this hill rolled away into nowhere. It took two seconds and was entirely gone. The whole hillside was brightly lit up and then nothing. We freaked out and got out of there as fast as humanly possible. We both saw it. There were no other people, no moving clouds and no roads from which headlights could shine. We still have no explanation for what we witnessed. This story happened three years ago when I was 15. It happened in my village. I don't tell this story much because people tend to think that I'm making it up, but I've been thinking of it quite a lot this week and I just wanted to share it. My village is located in a rural area that is protected by the government because it has been considered a natural paradise for the last 30 years. This means that exploration in this area is quite difficult nowadays since it is forbidden to cut trees, which means that it is a huge forest. I was spending my summer there and my favorite thing was to go hiking, although I had never gone into the woods alone, just on roads with people. My grandma had told me the cleaning services had opened and rehabilitated a path that had been covered in bushes and trees for the last 30 years because of a race that was being prepared, like runners and stuff. Usually I'd go to the nearest town about an hour away on foot by the only way that I knew, the road. On my way back from seeing friends there, I took the new path that my granny told me was safe. I went alone. That was a mistake. The first part of the path was the easiest, just too many obstacles and landslides, but it was nothing compared to the rest. The second part was a hill full of rocks that was the hardest thing to go up. Literally, I had to climb up on my arms and legs like a dog. When I got to the top, I looked around and found some animal bones. I didn't pay much attention to it since the area is known for its big population of wolves and bears that go out at night. I continued my way faster than before. This part was plain floor where the woods really begin. So it was a relief when I got to a dead end. Some huge trees had fallen exactly on a row on the path and it was impossible to cross them. This seemed really off to me because there were no other fallen trees. The weirdest part, beside those trees, there was this little barn. Yes, a barn in the middle of the woods. I thought to myself that it was probably abandoned. It looked like it. So I decided to throw my bag into the little field that belonged to the barn and I crossed the fence. 
I crossed it running without realizing the most bizarre thing. The field had no trees. It was clear. No bushes, no big plants, nothing. It really shouldn't be like that if it was abandoned, and nobody had been able to cut anything down there for years. I started feeling concerned about how the location of the fallen trees was so coincidental, how there casually was this barn beside a clear field when the path had been closed for 30 years. It just seemed really off. I went on, and luckily, I was reaching the last hill that my grandma had described, the one that connected with the village. Suddenly, there was a moment of silence in the woods. Absolute silence, which allowed me to hear some branches cracking behind me. I thought to myself it was probably a bird or something, but they came closer, and they sounded like footsteps. After trying to convince myself it was probably just an animal, I was way too afraid to look back. I started walking faster. And guess what? So did the footsteps. I just took off running after I noticed that, and so did the footsteps. At this point, I was running for my life. Suddenly, I started to hear incredibly loud grunts. Everything was going really fast. Luckily, I got to my village in a minute or so after that. I got onto the patio of the first house I found and closed the door. It was a relative's house, no need to call the police. I stayed there for 10 minutes until I got my breath back, and then I went home. I get chills just from remembering the place, not having a signal in the middle of nowhere. And the grunts. It makes me think there was something following me since the barn and the trees were just a distraction to slow me down. I never went into the woods alone after that. Over a week ago, my friend and I were out on the town. Later that night, we drove up to the forest about a mile up the hill and away from my house. It was about 9 p.m. when we arrived up there. It was a very strange night, to be honest. The moon was visible behind the clouds, and everything was very dark. We pretty much were just standing around for about 10 minutes next to my car, in the darkness, looking into the forest and having a smoke break. Then the forest got super quiet. After that, a guy with a dog came by, but nothing unusual, right? Well, then it got even quieter. That's when I spotted some strange lights in the forest. Probably half a mile inside, between the trees. It almost looked like candlelight. We didn't have any snow by then. It had been about a week or two since we'd had any, so it wasn't that. I told my friend and pointed over to the lights. They just shrugged it off and told me that it was clear. It was probably a house in the distance. But it wasn't, because I knew for a fact that there was no house there. There was only one farther up the road, not over there in that area of the forest. I knew that forest well. We were looking at and watching it for a bit, until this really strange feeling hit us, as though we were being watched. We heard some leaves rattling and some branches cracking. Otherwise, those lights looked like they were coming closer. I could swear it. Then I started to feel like I was hearing some kind of voice from where those lights were. But I couldn't be sure. It was very strange. After finishing the smoke break, we got back in the car since it felt way too creepy. Just to kind of put everything at ease, I said... No worries, we're just visiting and we come in peace. I know you're out there. My friend just glared at me like I was a mad woman, knowing that at least one Wendigo and some other beings roamed around this forest. At least that's what the stories say. Well, nothing really eventful happened, until afterwards. I went to bed that following night and I had a very strange, lucid dream. I could almost say it was astral for what it was worth. 
In the dream, I was going close to the forest, looking down to where the swamp was. It was a bright afternoon in the middle of winter. The snow was covering almost everything. Then there was a windigo. Now, there's one windigo that always appears in my dreams, but this one was different. It looked kind of like a bear's skeleton with a skull, a big skull that looked strange and had antlers and half a skeleton rotten like a corpse for a body. I stared at it and it looked at me and then just started running at me. The sound was deafening. You know that sound you hear after a loud explosion? It was like that, but with white noise and static in my vision. A moment later, I was awake, looking around. I said, what the heck? And then turned around and went to sleep again. I fell asleep and I woke up to the same dream. But this time, I was really mad. The next thing I remember was me bolting toward it, bearing some unhuman wrath, ramming my fist into its ribcage and tearing it apart. Moments later, I saw him fall apart, letting out some kind of screech. I later woke up and that was pretty much it. I don't know if the dream is connected to that place and what we saw, but something weird is definitely going on with that forest. My boyfriend and I absolutely adore hiking, and there are many places to go because we live in Oregon. Anyway, we decided to go hiking after 11 p.m. at night to one of the most used trails in our area. We had both been there multiple times throughout our lives, and neither of us were concerned about something happening. There was only one thing that we were kind of nervous about, and that was the wildfire that had just happened. We parked on the side of the road and walked to the start of the trail. Even though there was a fire path, it was actually very clean and stable. We started walking up the trail when we started talking about paranormal things. I know it was probably a terrible move on our side to talk about that sort of thing at night in the middle of the forest, but anyway. Now it is to be noted that we both had flashlights, very good ones and we were both being very observant as to where we were on the path. As we got deeper into the conversation, we both realized in just a second that we weren't on a trail anymore or anywhere near one. I mean, it was like in a blink of an eye. All of a sudden, I remember walking on the trail and then we just weren't. I freaked out and told him that we needed to start backtracking, but thankfully he said no because we couldn't see any trail around us or anything that we recognized. I truly believe if we had tried to backtrack, I wouldn't be here telling you this story. He told me that we needed to start walking up the hill in hopes of either standing on a ledge to see where we were or to find another path. We walked for a while up the hill when thankfully we popped out on a fire road. We walked all the way down, terrified, and came out on the road about a mile from where our car was. It was a really strange experience, and I don't really have any explanation. I just know in my gut that it's a really good thing we didn't turn around. A little bit of background about myself. I've worked my entire adult life in the Pacific Northwest woods, over 15 years in total, with about seven years of that being for the park service at Olympic National Park. Many, many experiences over the years could warrant the title of creepy, but this one in particular has always stuck with me. While working for the park service, one of my jobs was that of a restoration carpenter. 
we would travel to old backcountry historical cabins, emergency shelters, homesteads, and chalets, tasked with repairing and restoring them to their original historically accurate states. This was a wonderful and demanding job. I'd spend eight days at a time living off the beaten path, usually deep in the backcountry. Sometimes we'd be flown in supplies. Sometimes we'd use llamas or mules to pack our gear, all the while sleeping in thinly walled single tents, cooking over a fire or whisper light stove, using the same tools and techniques the original homesteaders had at their disposal in the late 1800s to construct and survive in this unforgiving environment. One late fall, I was assigned to work near Lake Ozette at an old homestead off the trail, near the constructed boardwalk. For those unfamiliar with the area, Lake Ozette is eight miles long and three miles wide. It sits as the largest unaltered natural lake in Washington. Lake Ozette has a long and rich history of Native American culture. The Macaw Tribal Center in Nia Bay houses discoveries found in the area dating back 2,000 years, along with a local village that was well preserved over 300 years ago by a mudslide that left most of the artifacts intact. The Ozette Loop Trail, which the homestead was directly adjacent to, is approximately 9.4 miles through and through. The man-made boardwalk takes you under giant cedar groves and meanders through huge patches of chest-high salal before delivering you to Alstrom's Prairie, about two and a half miles from the trailhead. Alstrom's Prairie, a giant, soggy meadow, was once farmed by two Swedish immigrants. They constructed a small cabin and some outbuildings on the 150-acre bog. With cattle, sheep, vegetable gardens, and the help of a little Swedish ingenuity, they managed to etch out lives for themselves here over 50 years. Over time, the forest, as it always does, decided to take back what was once its own. The now decades-long abandoned farm was hardly recognizable. Our job was to beat back the encroaching forest, put new windows in the main cabin, pipe in a new stove, apply fresh paint, and fix up portions of the semi-dilapidated barn the ultimate goal being to allow guided tours to take place sometime in the future. For about three weeks, we stayed at the OZ bunkhouse while working at Alstrom's. This was good duty for us. We weren't sleeping under the rain, our beds were warm, our hike was short, and the terrain was not difficult. We even had a TV. The bunkhouse was located near the highway and ranger station. We would hike the five mile loop every day bringing with us boards, tools, paint, and everything else we needed on our backs. These were full 10 plus hour days, usually starting in the morning around seven o'clock and beginning our evening return hike back to the bunkhouse around five. At one point during the fall, there were four of us working this project, but at the time of this event, there were only two of us remaining. Most of the hard work had already been finished. We needed to hike a few last boards into the prairie to complete a portion of the woodshed before we called the job done. I volunteered to be the pack mule for the day, my only job being to carry as many boards as I could muster in each trip to the prairie before returning to the ranger station for the next load. It was late in the season for hikers at this point, and the weather had turned. We'd be lucky to see two to three people a day going the loop. After around my fourth or fifth trip, I was pretty wiped. It was getting late in the evening now, around four o'clock, and my coworker had called it a day. I thought I could get one more trip in before it got too dark, my rationale being that the more trips I did that day, the less I'd have to do the next. We passed on the trail, I told him my intentions, and I continued on. I delivered the last of the boards for the day, took a look around the prairie as the sun began to tuck behind the trees and started my hour-long hike back to the ranger station. The lighting on the boardwalk was quite low at this point, the cedars blocking most of the ambient light left by the setting sun, and made visibility quite diminished. I'm not a nervous hiker, 
and I failed to spook easily, having solo hiked for weeks on end in the backcountry. I've been stalked by cougars, confronted by Kodiak bears in Alaska, and I've even ran into a few hillbillies over the years. Not the good kind. As I left the prairie that evening, the hair on my neck stood on end. Goosebumps erupted on my forearms. An uneasy feeling swept over me, and suddenly I wanted to walk faster, then jog, then sprint. I didn't. Instead, I convinced myself I'd been reading too many novels before bedtime. I walked another five minutes or so, before I started to hear something faint. Something that sounded like music. Impossible, I told myself. I'm the only one out here. And I'm still at least two miles from civilization. And that civilization, in reality, was the only other soul out there, my coworker. Sure enough, though, I heard music. More specifically, a piano. It started out so faintly that I had to stop moving and actually try to hear it, the steps on the wooden boardwalk being too loud. Every time I paused, it became unmistakable, and it got louder. I stood there, sun now fully hidden behind the horizon, in total silence other than this piano. I became aware that there were no longer the sounds of other life. No birds, no insects, no wind, no rustling of leaves or underbrush. Absolutely nothing other than the piano. As if everything was being weighted down by a fog of emptiness of some kind. I've encountered this dead time before in the woods. Certain places have it, but this was different somehow. Unique to this place unique to this moment in time. I tried to focus on the keys, but I couldn't recognize the composition. Unsurprising, as I mostly listened to Metallica and Korn at the time. It was playing with a purpose. It was controlled, in tune, thoughtful. It was a song, and somehow, I felt that it was meant just for me in that moment. I started walking again, almost on cue, the music got louder. As my pace increased, so did the tempo of the keys, still in tune, never faltering. It reached a climax, the perfect combination of my haste, my dread, my heartbeat, and the tempo of this music. And then, as quickly as it had started, the piano stopped, whooshed away in the fraction of a moment. It didn't trail off, it didn't fade into extinction, it was just gone. Suddenly, everything that was absent was swept away as if by a gust of wind. The stillness was gone. The gloom, the stagnation and weight of everything was lifted. My next step on the boardwalk was once again in reality. The evening was just as absent of light as before, but it felt like life somehow was once again injected back into the forest. The woods seemed normal again. I didn't hear the piano again that night, and I haven't since. I told my coworker every detail when I reached the bunkhouse, and he showed no sign of disbelief. We didn't talk about it again until years later, when something similar happened to another Park Service employee. When I told my grandfather about what happened, as he was a retired park ranger who had worked nearby at Mora, the next station over, Without the least bit of hesitation, he asked, Did you hear the bagpipes along with it, or was it just the piano this time? It seems, as I've learned and experienced since then, that there is a lot more to that place, a lot more to the Olympics in general, than anyone really knows or is willing to admit. I have had many paranormal, seemingly extraterrestrial, glitch in the matrix and skinwalker experiences. I think one too many for one person to have. The one I am going to tell you about freaks me out to this day. There is quite a bit of detail to this story, so I will try to make it as coherent as possible. 
The time was 2011, my final year of high school. Now, I am a Navajo from a small reservation in New Mexico, and the nearest city is 30 miles west. I attended a public school in that city. Therefore, I had to wake up at 5 a.m. every morning to catch the bus at 6, which picked up more kids along the way, and we would arrive with just enough time to get breakfast before class at 7.25. This particular morning seemed normal. My alarm went off at 5. I showered, fixed my hair, and was ready by 5.40. I would usually give myself 10 to 15 minutes to make some breakfast and pack my lunch. I did just that and decided to have Pop-Tarts that morning. I checked the time on the stove clock and it was 5.50. I popped the tarts into the toaster and went to my room to gather my things into my backpack. As I was finished with that, I saw that my alarm clock read 5.55 and I went to grab my Pop-Tarts. The stove clock read 5.56. We had a big clock right by our front door and it also read 5.56. I checked the time often so that I could perfectly time my walk to the bus so that it showed up just as I arrived at my bus stop. Additionally, it was a winter morning and it was dark out. The sun didn't start to come up until about seven and I didn't want to be stuck in the cold dark for too long. Normally, when I stepped outside, there would be cars driving about, neighbors who turned on their vehicles to warm them up from a frigid winter night. But that morning there was nobody, and that was a bit strange to me, but I didn't pay that fact any mind. Now since it's the reservation, aka the middle of nowhere where I lived, there wasn't much light either. Few residents had street lights in the cluster of homes where I lived. Unfortunately, the route that I walked every day had no street lights, so the only lights I could see in the near pitch black were the ones at my back from our porch light in the north, a neighbor's porch light who lived three acres away in the southern direction, and the far off lights of the city that lit the sky in the east. There were also the lights from the reservation clinic, which was about a mile south as well. I should also let you know that each home in a cluster of homes is set on an acre lot. My bus stop was two acres away. I would walk directly south to meet up with the only paved road, the highway, which met the dirt road in the east. From my home to that stop, it only took me a minute or two. When I stepped outside, nothing was astir, which, like I said, was really odd. However, I wasn't out there alone, because although it was almost pitch black, I saw the silhouette of a girl who caught the bus at the same time as I did, and at the same stop. Good, I thought, I'm not out here alone. I followed about 10 feet behind her. When we neared the stop, she veered off to the cattle guard where she always sat to wait for the bus. I always sat on the porch steps of my uncle's house when the bus hadn't arrived yet, which was only about five to 10 yards from the bus stop. When I sat on those steps, I started to notice more and more things that were out of place. One of those was the fact that my uncle, an early riser who was always awake by five, who always had his lights on by the time I was catching the bus, was not awake. He wasn't out having his morning coffee as usual. No lights, no sounds from inside his house. I thought, maybe he's sleeping in today. Then the neighbor whose home was three acres away from mine, my uncle's next door neighbor, whose porch light was on, would normally have had their vehicle running, warming up by now, and their lights would be on showing that somebody was awake and probably getting ready for work. But there were no signs of anybody being awake at all, and the truck wasn't on. Well, maybe they have the day off, I thought, still waiting for the bus. The other girl's silhouette I could see from the city lights that lit the sky to the east, and she was still sitting there and waiting as well. I was a little bit unsettled, but I didn't start to feel really creeped out until I started to hear the howls and yelps from what sounded to be a pack of coyotes that seemed to be only across the main highway. Since I didn't have a cell phone at the time, 
I had guessed that I was waiting for about 10 minutes. Finally, I thought, okay, this is ridiculous. Where is the bus? It should have been here by now. I was on time and it was very unlike the bus or the bus driver to pick us up more than five minutes late. I decided to wake up my uncle and ask if maybe we had missed the bus. So I knocked on his door for a good three minutes to no avail. Then I just decided to walk over and ask the girl if she wanted to walk back to our homes together, since I was sufficiently weirded out by the events. As I neared her and where she sat, my eyesight adjusted in the darkness. And when I was within arm's reach, I saw that there was nobody there. I thought I was going crazy. My mind raced and I felt panic and queasy in the pit of my stomach. All the creepy skinwalker and paranormal stories that I had heard over the years began to run amok in my mind. But what remains from those stories was that I was always told to never fear any of it. You should never be afraid of the evil things that lurk in the darkness because your fear is their fuel. I decided not to panic and run home. Instead, I just walked briskly back home, still able to hear the whoops and calls from the nearby pack of coyotes and trying to figure out what was going on. When I got inside, I went to my mom's room and asked to use her cell phone. Just as she was about to hand me her cell, she took a second glance at the screen and said, it's four in the morning. What do you need my phone for? Shock took hold of my body, and all I could do was stand there with my mouth wide open as she trailed her remark with, Are you awake? Have you been sleepwalking? I have never sleptwalked in my entire life, and my reply felt forced, like I had to convince her that I was awake. I ran back to the kitchen. The clock read 4 a.m. The clock by the front door read 4 a.m. And the alarm clock in my room read 4 a.m. I don't know anything about any of these types of sleep disorders, but I seriously think that there's no way for me to have gone through with my usual routine the way that I did asleep. Needless to say, I was sufficiently freaked out and crawled back into bed. So freaked out I didn't even take my shoes off. I fell asleep thinking of the whole situation, and ironically I missed the bus that day. I told my third oldest sister there are four of us and I'm the youngest, about what had happened. She was a little shocked at what she was hearing. And then she began to tell me of a dream she had before my experience. Now her dreams we have begun to revere as visions of sorts, since she's had many of them end up coming true. Her earliest one, I remember, was when we were in elementary school and my dad called and said that earlier in the day he was in a small airplane and that they nearly crashed into the mountains near San Carlos, Arizona. She told us about a dream about being in an airplane in a heavily forested area, that the plane was about to crash, but was able to land safely a few days before we got that call from our dad. Since then, she's had others, some she tells us about, others she doesn't. Before I tell you about the dream, I must also tell you about a weird incident that happened to said sister at my eldest sister's house. This particular incident happened the summer preceding the winter. I had a weird experience. My sister, the dream visionary, would stay over at my eldest sister's house to help babysit my nephews. They would stay up very late, and one night or morning, because it was around 2 a.m., they heard a sort of banging in the back of the house. My sister and the nephew went out to check. When they opened the door, they saw two horses, one white and one brown, kicking with their hooves and hitting their heads against the big garbage bins, which were knocking into the house. It was as if they were trying to get in, but for what, we had no clue. To add to that weirdness, my sister's house is in a housing development that has two entrances, and since it's on the reservation, those entrances have cattle guards. So how could those two horses have gotten in? Anyway, they chased the horses out of the yard and they galloped off to who knows where. Anyway, back to her dream. She said that she was asleep at my eldest sister's house. 
and woke up to the same banging noise that those horses had been making that night in the summer. She said she got up and walked to the front window and looked out past the blinds and saw those same horses standing just inches from her on the other side of the window. Then she saw the two horses shape shift into people, an in-law and his son. They had menacing looks on their faces, and she said she felt that they were pure evil. She yelled at them to go away, and as soon as she turned away, she saw me, sleepwalking toward the back door. She went to grab me to put me back in bed, but as she got closer, she saw that the back door was wide open and that the son was beckoning me to follow him, to go outside. As I took a few steps out the door, she pulled me back inside, slammed and locked the door, and laid me back down, and that was where her dream ended. The story, however, gets creepier. After that weird time warp occurrence coupled with my sister's dream, my mom decided to take me to see a medicine man to have a prayer ceremony. He said that it was a skinwalker who was messing with our family. He said that the skinwalker intended to destroy my mom's life, but that she was too strong, and that the harm it wished for her would then fall to her children, the weaker ones. And here I thought I was being pretty strong. Further, he said that the skinwalker impersonated the shadow of the girl who usually rode the bus with me, and was also the one who created the sounds of the coyotes. The skinwalker created an illusion to lure me outside, and that the skinwalker was someone within the family. After the prayer ceremony, he said that I should never repeat anything that he said, or even the events that occurred. I don't think a lot of people heed that, though. I don't know if he would call it a warning or advice from the medicine man, but a lot of Navajos, if you get close enough to them, and they're not super traditional, will tell you all about scary and weird skinwalker stories of their own. They're pretty common, and even the ones that caused them to have to get a prayer or ceremony done, they'll tell those too. And this story is mine. About five years ago, when I was 14, my best friend and I, both female, went for a walk on a hiking route in our village. We had always known that it existed, but we'd never gone there, so we didn't know how long the hike would take. About halfway through, it started to get really dark outside. The route was a road through the woods that had no streetlights whatsoever. So we called one of our guy friends that had a crosser bike to come so that we wouldn't be alone. He came and we continued our walk in complete darkness. He turned off the bike because it was loud and decided to just push it. We didn't use our flashlights because the moonlight illuminated our path. As we were walking and talking, I heard something about 20 feet away in the woods that sounded like a loud scream through crying. I immediately stopped and looked at my friends, because I thought I was the only one who had heard it. But their terrified looks told me that they had heard it too. The two of them jumped on the bike and I ran after them to the first street light. Yeah, I know, they left me behind. We were panicking and trying to find an explanation for that sound. Maybe some kind of animal? Until I remembered a story about the Drekovac. I live in Balkan, and I don't think the name has a translation, but I guess I would call it maybe a howler or a screamer. Basically, it's a mythology creature characteristic in the Balkans, and there are probably 20 different beliefs as to what it is. This is the only paranormal thing that has ever happened to me, and to this day, I get goosebumps when I tell the story to somebody because I remember it like it happened yesterday. Last summer, my family of four and I 
were backpacking and camping near a river. It was a remote canyon in a very wild area, and it was quite blissful, until we woke up around two o'clock in the morning to a very distressing sound. We were sleeping in our hammocks very close to the river, and about 40 feet behind us was a tall canyon wall. The sound made me think of an injured animal that was very cat-like. It was coming from behind us toward the wall of the canyon. It was regular. It occurred like clockwork every 15 to 20 seconds. We thought this was unusual. We shined flashlights and spoke very loudly in hopes of frightening whatever it was away from us. There was no moon out and we could see very little, but shining our flashlights around revealed nothing as well. Still, it sounded so very close. Our efforts did not work at all, and it seemed relentless and completely unfazed by us in every way. I worried that it was rabid or hurt. At one point, I heard it near the river, on the other side of us, and I was incredibly confused as to how it was able to move around without us hearing it. I sat on the edge of my hammock until dawn, with my knife in my hand, waiting for a wild or sick animal to come out of the bushes at any moment, and having to fight for our lives. Fortunately, that didn't happen. Finally, around dawn, the sounds got less frequent, and eventually they stopped. After hiking out, we googled many different animal sounds, the closest we could find to what we had heard was a mountain lion mating call. There definitely were lions in that area, so I still believe that that's what we heard. I'm still really confused, though, as to why it stayed so very close to us, and why it wasn't scared away like most animals would be. I'm also confused as to how it got from one side to the other without us detecting it. We've seen black bear in this area many times, and they've always run in the other direction when seeing humans, and cats are even more elusive. So, regardless of what happened, it was very strange behavior. And it still gives me the creeps to this day. I'm a 27-year-old female, and I went backpacking alone over the recent long weekend, which was 10 out of 10 beautiful. The second night I camped at a beautiful high elevation lake, which could also be accessed by a short one mile trail. So there were a few other campers and several people who were just day hiking or fishing. It was late afternoon and I was sitting around my camp reading when a guy in his mid-twenties walked by carrying a fishing pole and a small cooler. I didn't think much of it. But five to ten minutes later, he doubled back and came and said hello. I said, hi, and went back to reading. But then, without warning, he sat down on a stump next to me. I was completely taken aback at this invasion of my space. He started asking me questions that were really just statements, but in a creepy, amused tone, like, so, you're just reading? And then looked behind me and noticed my tent and said, oh, you're staying the night here alone, huh? I didn't say anything in response to this in particular, but it was obvious that I was. It's hard to explain, but his vibe was just really off. I was so uncomfortable that I couldn't even really form words or tell him that I was trying to be alone and get him to leave me alone. I was honestly paralyzed. His eyes were so dead and dark, and they just drilled into me. I just responded with things like, uh-huh, or yep, or something like that, and tried to pretend that I was still reading. Without warning, he pulls out and cracks open a beer and lights a cigarette and just starts blowing the smoke at me. At this point, I am so uncomfortable and just not responding. Soon, another hiker wandered by and he strikes up a conversation with him. And I took the opportunity to grab my water filter and bladder and pretend that I needed to get water. 
I went to the shore and filtered some water super slowly, and I saw him walk away to go sit with the new guy, which made me pretty relieved, except that he kept looking in my direction. I came back eventually and got inside my tent, and for about 20 minutes, everything was fine. I had the rain fly pulled back and was just watching the sunset and loosely organizing my things. When he popped out from behind my tent and stood maybe one foot from my door, looking down at me. He didn't say anything, but he just started laughing this really creepily fake laugh. I said, what? And his response was, this is just really funny. I literally felt sick to my stomach, and I finally responded with something like, I'm taking a nap now, so you have a good night. He laughed again, but luckily he left. Later, I saw him still wandering around the camp with no real purpose, still looking in my direction often. I had no service, but I wrote down his last name, at least what was written on his cooler, and where he said he was from while talking to the other hiker in my notes app, just in case, and I slept with my pocket knife close. I debated leaving camp that night, but I ended up staying and just leaving super early in the morning, in case he came back. Normally while backpacking, I think the worst thing that could happen is that I might run into a bear or sprain an ankle, and maybe this seems not as bad as you're reading this. But in the moment, face to face, this truly was the most unsettling experience I've ever had in the backcountry. I'm sure I'll be back out soon, but hopefully somewhere far away from this dude. This creepy encounter occurred in the fall of 2001. My family lived in a nice house in the middle of some dense woods. A few of my friends consistently brought their four-wheelers with them when they came to spend the night. We had a huge yellow four-wheeler and rode pretty much constantly that year. The woods behind my parents' house had trails, every which way, that snaked around and down the haulers and to the roads. My friends and I, 11 to 12 years old at the time, had these big plans to get street signs and put them on the trees so that all of our trails would have their names proudly displayed. One day, a friend came to stay and we rode around on the trails for hours. When we became bored of the trails, we took off on the main road to a fire training center about three miles away. The fire training center was down a one-lane gravel road with trees butting up to the side so close that a car would get scratched going down it. At the end of the road was a pole gate to keep people like us out. On the way there, we passed by a small pickup truck with two men in it. When we got to the little trail that went down and around the gate, we saw a dead dog wrapped up in a blanket, blocking the path. We decided to turn around because I didn't want to run over the thing. So we started heading back on the main road, and again, about halfway back, we passed the small pickup truck with the men. My friend and I joke that the men are following us because they know we saw the dog that they dropped off and that they hadn't buried it the way they should have. We get almost back to my house and decide we can probably find another trail around the dog, maybe on the other side of the gate. So off we go. We turn on to the little gravel road and go to the end. There is no other trail, no other way around, but the dog is kind of laying on half of the blanket. So we sit there for a few minutes while I try to convince my friend if she just tugs on the edge of the blanket, we could move the blanket and the dog out of the way without actually touching or disturbing it. She's not budging, but I really want to ride on the other side of the gate. After a few minutes, it's clear that she is not touching the blanket so we turn around to head back home. We start back down the gravel road and after a second, we turn to the straight part. Panic set in quickly. The small pickup is sitting in the road, blocking our only exit. The trees touch both sides of the truck, so there's no going around it. Two large men sit staring at us. 
After what feels like forever, I whip the four-wheeler around and go through the trail anyway. We get around the gate into safety. Were they watching me try to persuade her to move the blanket? Could they see us the whole time? Were they still moving until we got to the clear part? What would have happened if I hadn't given up on the blanket? Those questions scare me now as much as they did back then. That gravel road only goes to the fire training center, which is blocked off by a large metal gate. A car that pulls down there is only able to back the entire way out onto the main road. Anyway, we soon forgot about it and it really didn't change much. I like to think that our town is really safe and that the men were just curious about what the heck we were doing going back and forth. But when I read some stories, I think about what it could have been, how it could have gone differently, and it really freaks me out. I live in a tiny town in northern BC. We are surrounded by a lot of untouched forests and beautiful rivers. My family lives out in the country and we're about 10 minutes away from an uninhabited valley. It had an old road going through it from ages ago and it had an old pioneer homestead that we could make our way down to. I think some loser kids burnt it down around 2000 or 2001 though. Even from a young age, I hated going to this place with my family. I had no reason to despise it so much. Everyone that visited was always in awe of how beautiful it was down there. But I always just got this sick feeling in my stomach. My sighting was from when I was very young, so I realize not many will believe it, but it stuck with me. My family was showing a cousin from Australia this place. Our town is boring, so outdoor stuff is really all we have to offer and I was sitting on my dad's shoulders while the adults walked around. Now the road we were on had large shrubs on either side. In BC, we have a berry called Saskatoons, and the bushes on this stretch were tall and thick. Because I was on my dad's shoulders, I could see over these, but nobody else could. I remember looking over, and on the other side of these bushes was this big field with a dense forest on the other side. I saw something massive and stark white walking on two legs into those trees. As a dumb kid, I yelled out, Polar bear! Which my parents obviously ignored because there are absolutely no polar bears here. And that was that. I still have no idea what I saw. But I'm sure there could be a rational explanation involving an albino animal, possibly an overactive kid's imagination. My neighbor, who is also the closest thing that I've had to a grandfather, lives in a spot that overlooks a large field with a valley below. You pass his home to get onto the property that I had my sighting on. A few years ago, he told us of a night that he watched what he thought was a helicopter coming in to land in the large field below his home. Right as he looked at it, it was landing, and then it shot straight up and disappeared into the sky. He's a pretty serious guy, and he said this in front of my parents, so I doubt he would lie. He's convinced that he witnessed a UFO. At that point, I thought, all right, maybe there was something to what I saw. And then, my younger sister had a sighting. She was driving home on our country road after a late shift. She remembered seeing two dark silhouettes of people, no reflective clothing or anything walking in the pitch black and thinking, wow, what idiots. Just then, one of these things turns and glances at her. She told me that it had green eye shine, which she knew that humans shouldn't have, yet it was human shaped. She glanced quickly down at her clock and then back up and whatever she had seen had completely disappeared in front of her. I'm still not sure what I saw that day but given that my neighbor and my sister have seen things that are strange in the same general area, I'm thinking maybe I wasn't such an imaginative kid after all.
I am an avid hiker and backpacker. Most of the time I hike by myself and I sleep out in the woods by myself. I have a good amount of time in the backcountry, and up until this incident, I would never have claimed to have experienced anything even remotely paranormal. Ticks, in my book, are the real scary monsters. This past weekend, I set out for a solo hike in the Catskill Mountains in New York. When I arrived at the trailhead, two other hikers, not together, also pulled up. This area has no marked trails, so any landmark worth getting to is technically a bushwhack. After some friendly salutation, the three of us established that we had generally similar itineraries, and we decided to head up to the highland together. Eventually, one of the guys fell behind, and after waiting for a bit, the other guy, we can call him New Hiker Bro, and I figured that he changed his plans, and so we pushed on. We summited two peaks together and then decided to extend the trip a bit in search of an 80-year-old plane crash that is situated in a very rugged area in between the ridge lines of the peaks we bagged. After some more heavier bushwhacking, we found the wreck. I knew that people had died in the crash, but I had read about a number of plane crashes in the Catskills at the time. I didn't remember the exact details of this particular relic. I just knew it was there. It's certainly a somber experience when you happen on any place that you know somebody took their last breath, especially in such a violent way. But besides just a general feeling of sympathy and melancholy, I can't say that I felt any sort of eerie vibes. It was a beautiful day, and the post-hike beer was the next waypoint. New hiker bro and I silently walked around the wreck, taking pictures and video, and being careful not to touch anything. Our individual wanderings had put us about 25 to 30 yards away from each other, and in between us was a water drainage, so we couldn't really hear each other, even if we wanted to talk. We explored in continued silence for about 20 minutes when I closed my camera. As soon as my viewfinder snapped into the camera body, I heard a deep male voice that did not sound like new hiker bro say, Nice shot. The best way I can describe the timber of the voice was like a compressed amplified whisper, almost like Christian Bale's Batman, but with more tonal quality and with sort of a digital texture to it. It sounded close, but also like it was in surround sound. The woods can do some really funky things with sound, all very rooted in good old fashioned science, especially when we're on the side of a mountain in between two ridge lines and next to a drainage. I just assumed it was somebody, and I looked up from the direction I thought it came, half expecting to see the other hiker that we'd been separated from earlier. We had discussed the plane crash on our way up, so I thought it was just him being funny. He wasn't there, though. Nobody was there in any direction. New hiker bro was down the ridge a bit, and he was busy framing a shot by now about 40 yards away from me. I made my way to him and asked if he had said something. He had not. To be honest, the creepy still didn't set in until about 10 minutes later. I just figured it was someone's voice carrying from somewhere up the ridge line above us. But as we made our way back to the more established herd path, the more I thought about it, the more the creep creeped in. I distinctively heard, nice shot. I would swear by it, to anyone, on anything. As we got back to easier ground, New Hiker Bro filled me in on the specific details of the plane crash. Three souls on board for a military training mission, post-World War II. They went off course in bad weather. Two of their remains were found. One never was. I never shared what I heard with New Hiker Bro. I don't think anybody wants to walk out of the woods with a total stranger spewing ghost stories in real time. Honestly, I still feel like there's got to be an explanation, but I just can't get over the nice shot part, especially right as I closed my camera. This probably has nothing to do with it, but I also think it's kind of interesting that, like the people on the plane, 
We walked into the woods as a group of three, and one of us, for lack of a better term, went missing. I do wildlife photography, so I go hiking every Sunday and have been for about a year now. With the frequency with which I go hiking, it might be surprising that I have two experiences. Or maybe not, I'm not sure about frequency. Both my experiences take place in the western part of Wisconsin. My first experience was at a semi-defunct state campground in the middle of summer. I say semi-defunct because there was a newer gravel parking lot by the gravel road, and a gated off-road leading deeper into what used to be a paved parking lot and paved RV and campsites. It's about a mile from the gravel parking lot to the paved lot, and this walk goes just fine. The road continues past the paved lot for about a mile, and then splits into almost non-existent trails. It was after I got past the paved lot that things started to get strange. I started to get a feeling that was hard to describe. It just felt wrong. Every step I took came with the thought, you shouldn't take another step. You should turn around. This feeling kept growing and growing in intensity until I got to the end of the road and I just couldn't take it anymore. I turned back and went back because I had the strong feeling that if I went on a trail, something very bad would happen. The walk back to the gravel lot was just fine and by the time I got to the lot, the feeling was completely gone. I looked for agates on the gravel road. The second one I will say I think was probably just a deer, but I'll let you decide. This hike was in the early fall. I went off trail, down a gully, and followed a small creek. All in all, it was a good hike, until I rounded a bend and saw a cave. My initial thought was to go check it out. Then that nagging feeling came and was like, no, something bad is in there. I was admittedly thinking more along the lines of a homeless person or something like that. Not that homeless people are bad, just that I didn't want to get into an altercation. As soon as I turned away, I had that same being watched feeling that so many people describe, and I just had to get out of there. So I backtracked my steps and was about two miles into the hike back, when that feeling suddenly got much, much stronger eyes darting all over the place, I was literally almost walking sideways on the trail. Then all of a sudden, there was a huge crash behind me, and to the right. I didn't see anything before or after this crash. This is where I think it might have been a deer, but I didn't see anything. This feeling intensified all the way until I got into my car and locked the doors. It got better as I collected myself in the car. I don't know how to explain these could just be an overactive fight-or-flight response, but they stick out so much from all of my other experiences that I can't help but think of them and wonder if I had tuned in to something else. I was a sophomore in high school when this happened, and I haven't gone back. It's midsummer in New England, and my best friend, let's call him Andy, and I are hanging out. I live on conservation land, so aside from the houses at the very front, there are no other developments, and woodlands that span for acres and acres are all around. The state put down some paths, so I suggested that we go exploring. We geared up, I brought my pocket knife, sprayed myself down in bug spray, and headed out my backyard. We hadn't explored too much, but I knew the area somewhat well, so we decided to hell with the trails. We're going to be real men and forge our own path. We enter the woods, thickly forested with pine, maple, and oak trees, and make notches in the trees on the way so we can find our way back. It's around noon, so I'm not too worried about it getting dark. After all, the sun sets around 8 p.m. in the summer, but 
just in case. We walk deeper and deeper into the woods. About 15 minutes and the forest is alive. Bugs, frogs, birds, everything in this forest is loud. Slightly irritating, truthfully, but it's nice to take in the sights and the sounds. Soon we stumble upon a peculiar scene. A perfect circle, probably 20 feet in diameter, that spans from the ground all the way to the sky. I'm perplexed, but Andy is curious, so we decide to go in. The first thing I noticed is that the overgrown weeds and grass that surrounded us stopped at the perimeters. All vegetation past that line was dead. Not bare, but dead, crunching under our feet. I don't just mean the grass either, but the tree limbs that extended in were also completely bare. Leaves down the branch until it crossed the line, then nothing. Being the middle of summer, nothing should be dead. And I've never seen a branch behave like that. I'm feeling an extreme unease. I turn to Andy and ask him if he feels it. He says he feels like we're being watched, and I agree. It's then that we notice the strangest sense. The entire forest has gone silent. Not in rest, but in what feels like suspense. I'm feeling very uneasy now, and I know that we need to leave. We run out of there following our tree marks, and when we got back to my house, the forest was alive again. Ever since then, every summer, every winter, a snarl of branches, sometimes leafed, sometimes not, reveals our path through the forest. I swear that whatever was watching us from that circle peers through and wants us to come back. My dad was an outdoorsman all of his life, and he had a few favorite hunting spots in central Wisconsin. My whole family spent countless amounts of time out in the woods of central Wisconsin and know them pretty well. Sometimes we'd take trips to just hang out in the woods throughout the year. Anyway, my dad isn't here anymore, but we still take random trips out into the woods just to get away. My brothers tend to spend more time out in the woods than I do, and more than the rest of the family does, as they went out there with Dad the most. It's a sentimental thing. Two years ago, my family was having a get-together one spring or summer weekend. After dinner, my brothers went out into the woods to see what wildlife would be out. As one is a photographer, he's always trying to get shots of owls. Plus, they also wanted to check out one of the spots they like to camp at. I don't remember what time it was when they came back, but they were acting off. Then one of them started talking about something really messed up that was going on not too far from one of their camping spots. My mom and my sister and I, almost at the same time, asked them what it was. They said they were out walking around one of their campsites and wandered off just a little ways from it, only to stumble upon what looked like a bloodbath. They said blood was just everywhere. There were also peppers, corn husks, and some rocks that were all situated oddly, with blood all over everything. It looked like someone had even recently dug a hole, like to bury something. Now, at first I was about to say bullshit, because in the past they would come back with some BS story that you could tell they were making up. But this time was different. There was not even a hint of a smile or a laugh on either of their faces. They said that the disturbed ground where the hole was dug and filled in looked like it was big enough to put a small animal or maybe a human baby in. They just couldn't stop talking about the amount of blood that was all over. We told them they should call the sheriff's department as it could be something serious. It wouldn't be the first time that a body was found out in these parts. They wanted to, but then decided not to because they'd been drinking. Naturally, we were pissed at them for just wanting to leave it alone. I kept putting the pressure on them to report it, and three days later, one finally did. He'd been asking some of the people at his work about what they thought it could be, 
and one had mentioned that in their culture, it wasn't unusual to find a place out in the woods to perform a ceremony and bury a baby if it had passed away. That really unsettled my brother, as cemeteries are where the dead logically go to be laid to rest, and the amount of blood still had him on edge, so that's what made him finally report it. After the area was investigated by authorities, what they dug up from the hole turned out to be a rabbit, not a human. The sheriff did say that he really appreciated him reporting it anyway, because there really are all kinds of strange things that happen out in rural areas. It never hurts to be cautious and report suspicious things. Back in the early 1990s, I was a kid, around 13 at the time of this incident. And I used to stay at my grandparents' house a lot, out in a very rural area in southeastern Arkansas. When I say very rural, I mean it was a series of networked dirt roads to get out to their house. The closest neighbors besides my aunt and uncle, who lived about a quarter of a mile up the road, was over a mile and a half away. This was very backwoods and isolated from most civilization. The closest town was a 10 mile trip. It's in the middle of farmland and mostly woods. They had lived in this house since my mother was a child and had both grown up just a ways down the road. Anyway, there was a general store roughly three to four miles down the network of dirt roads. This was your typical country general store run by an old lady and her husband and its only customers really consisted of the people who lived out there in BFE. One day my grandmother asked me if I wanted to walk to the general store and get her some milk, eggs, and a few other miscellaneous items, and I told her I would. She gave me some money and I headed on my way. It was fairly early in the day and I had plenty of time to get back before dark, which I always made sure to do when I was out roaming about. Things can get mighty creepy out in the backwoods of Arkansas after nightfall, it's a darkness unlike most people who have lived primarily in cities or towns have ever experienced. Me being a 13-year-old, I had poor time management skills. I stopped at the bottom of a hill next to this small wooden bridge you have to cross and messed around at the creek catching crawdads and such, and I kind of just messed around the whole way to the store. By the time I left the store, I realized it was quickly approaching dark. This was fall, and darkness set upon the land pretty early in the day. I didn't want to be walking those lonely, secluded roads through the woods alone in the dark, so I hurried as fast as I could, running and sprinting as much as possible. But it wasn't enough. By the time I had made it back to the bottom of the hill near the bridge, it was almost completely dark, and there was an eerie sort of glow brought about by a very bright, nearly full moon that was rising. At the top of the hill, the road was perfectly straight and flat, with woods on the left side and a large field on the right. About a half mile up from the top of the hill is my grandparents' house, and you can see it from there. As I top the hill, I can see the faint glow of the lights at their house, and I feel a sense of relief because I was kind of freaking out a little bit. But knowing that I was so close and could see the house offered me a little bit of comfort. The field on the right was somewhat illuminated by the glow of the moon, and my eyes had adjusted to the darkness rather well at this point. As I walked up the road, I heard something from the left, behind me on the wooded side of the road. It sounded like leaves being rustled. I turned to look, and I see nothing at first. But then as my eyes begin to focus, I see something in the ditch, a black, shadowy shape, slowly moving toward me. At first I thought it was a dog, but then I realized it was much too large to be a dog. And then I realized it wasn't actually walking on four legs. It was crawling like a person would. I stared for a moment out of sheer confusion, trying to figure out what I was seeing. And then a jolt of fear shot through me as it dawned on me that whatever this thing was, it had been trying to sneak up on me. At that exact moment, this thing stood upright out of the ditch on two legs like a person. It had the shape of a human, 
long arms, legs, and was proportioned as such. It stood roughly seven to eight feet in height and was completely covered in black or maybe dark brown hair. Its face was dark in color, and I can't recall seeing much in the way of features due to it being night. It was no bear, that's for certain, or any other kind of animal that I had ever seen for that matter. I immediately dropped the bag of stuff I had been carrying and bolted as fast as my legs could take me toward my grandparents' house. I heard a heavy breathing, guttural, growling kind of sound behind me, and I heard this thing's footsteps running up behind me on the gravel as it gave chase. I didn't turn around. I was certain that it would grab me at any moment. Then I heard it crash off into the woods and let out an earth-shattering, ungodly scream unlike anything I have ever heard before or since. I'm positive this thing could have easily caught me had it wanted to, but for some reason, it let me go. By the time I reached my grandparents, my heart felt as if it would explode from the combination of the adrenaline rush I had from being scared beyond any type of fear I had ever felt before or since, and from full-on sprinting as hard and as fast as possible for about a half mile straight. I flew into the house and, in an incoherent mess of hyperactive gibberish, tried to explain to my grandparents what had just happened. My grandmother didn't really seem to believe me, but did believe that something had scared me and acted rather weird about the whole thing. She tried to convince me that it was just a dog or some other animal. The next morning I woke up and found my grandpa sitting outside whittling wood underneath the shade tree in the front yard, as he often liked to do. I went and sat down beside him in one of the old metal lawn chairs. He was a very rational man, down to earth, and had grown up in and hunted that area his entire life. He knew every square inch of it, mapped into his mind. He knew every type of critter and creature that lived in those woods, what noise they made, where to find them, how to catch them. I had only been hunting with him for a couple of years, but had been going out into those woods with him since a pretty young age, on walks and things like that. He had passed a lot of his knowledge down to me during those adventures. I spoke to him about what had happened to me the night before, and told him that I knew what I saw. It wasn't my overactive imagination. I wasn't making it up. And it definitely wasn't a dog. He knew that I wasn't just some dumb 13-year-old kid. And he knew that I knew the things he taught me. He stopped whittling, looked me right in the eyes, and said, I know what you saw. I've seen it before, too. There's things out in them woods that people don't understand and that a person ought not go fooling with. I remember those words clearly to this day, because it gave me affirmation, but at the same time made me realize that whatever I had seen was very real in existence and beyond my understanding. My grandpa then went on to tell me that far back in the woods there are some cliffs, and that the bottom of one of those cliffs is a cave. He told me that the cave is where the creature lived. He had once stumbled upon it a long time ago when he was hunting. He said he was standing on the top of the cliff looking at it when a creature fitting the same description as mine emerged and began screaming wildly at him and throwing rocks. He said he took a shot at it, missed, and then this thing gave chase. But my grandpa was on top of the cliff, so in order to get to him, this thing had to go around a pretty good distance and then up, which he said it quickly began to do, so he hightailed it out of there in a hurry. He said the whole way back home he felt as if he were being watched, and he kept hearing twigs snap behind him. He was certain that this thing was following him, stalking him. He made it home, and as he reached his front porch, he turned and looked back at the woods from where he'd come, and he saw it peeking out at him from behind a tree. Later that night, he said that he and my grandmother awoke in the early morning hours to large rocks being thrown at the house and ungodly howling noises from outside, and this thing trying to get into the house. He said he could hear it walking around the front porch, rattling the doorknobs, banging on windows, and it sounded like it was muttering to itself in a low, deep, garbled voice, but it didn't sound like a language. 
just a bunch of gibberish. After a while, the thing went back to throwing some more rocks and howling. So, my grandpa grabbed his shotgun and fired it out the front door a few times into the darkness and into the direction of the howling. He said he heard it run back into the woods. He didn't know if he'd hit it or not. He said that was the last he'd ever seen nor heard from it, but over the years, an occasional farmer's cow would be mutilated, or someone's hunting dog would go inexplicably missing, or someone would have a story about some strange creature they'd seen. He also said it scared my grandmother beyond words, and she has absolutely refused to ever talk about it or even acknowledge that it happened, which explains her odd behavior when I told her what happened to me. I know it's a pretty far-fetched story, and you can believe it or not, it makes no difference to me. I know what I saw, and my grandpa knew what he saw, and neither of us have ever felt the need to convince anyone else of it. In fact, until today, I have never actually spoken of it to anyone other than my grandpa, and he passed away roughly ten years ago. This might not be the scariest story, but it sure put fear into us at the time. Years ago, a friend and I decided to go raccoon hunting on a large wooded piece of family land by a lake. We met at his house at about 11 p.m. and set off walking the half mile down the dirt road to the woods. We talked in low voices, catching up on things, and then we quieted down when we reached the fence where the property line was. We loaded our 22s and started looking for signs of our prey. The woods weren't totally quiet. They were full of country sounds, frogs singing on the lake, owls hooting back and forth in the trees, even mice running over the leaves that had fallen the previous fall. I was amazed how much noise a tiny little rodent could make. This whole time, we weren't really talking, just steadily walking through the dead leaves and pausing to listen to the sounds around us. Suddenly, completely out of the blue, the woods went dead silent. No frogs, no mice, no owls, nothing. My friend and I stopped in our tracks at the exact same time and commented on the silence. We stood there for a minute or so in dead silence, listening for a larger animal. We're not in bear country, so it couldn't be that. We listened for branches breaking, something that would indicate why everything went quiet, but there was nothing but the sound of our breathing. At the same time, we agreed we should go. We clicked the safeties off on our rifles and got out of there as hastily, but also as cautiously as we could manage, feeling a surge of adrenaline as we went. We didn't think to unload our rifles until we were a little more than halfway back to his house. Later, we both admitted that the silence dropping like that triggered something akin to an anxiety attack. I've been back to those woods several times since then, both in the daytime and at night, and I've never experienced anything close to that feeling. I have a few creepy backwoods stories, and this one may be a little out there. It's more than just creepy woods, and I can't explain it. It could have been some sort of mass hysteria or a group hallucination that lasted multiple days, maybe even shared sleep paralysis, but I doubt it. The story starts like this. About 10 years ago, I'm a cocky little brat, 18 year old dude who thinks he has the world by the balls. The world had me by the balls, I later discovered, and I was with my very serious girlfriend of two years and counting. First time I ever dated a girl, and I really felt like I was in love and could see myself marrying this girl. Thank God that didn't happen, but that's another story. So my parents are really strict conservative Christians. They'd never let me and my girlfriend Caitlin share a room at night. Caitlin's parents couldn't have given less of a crap. They let us drink and we had our own bedroom upstairs. Looking back, her mom was kinda not the best mother, but she was nice enough. 
One weekend in summer, Caitlin and her parents asked if I'd like to come up three hours north to her grandparents' town for their anniversary. This place is hours away from civilization, as secluded as it gets. See Amish people the whole way up, northern Michigan. I said, hell yeah. Her grandparents are wealthy and fun, and I knew it'd be a good time. But too many people stayed in their big, lovely house, so we had to rent a cabin. In the woods. This cabin is at least 20 minutes from the village or town or whatever. Right away, it seemed off. Is back in the woods, off this creepy, secluded, quiet dirt road. Everything silent. The houses next to us were dead silent and empty. It was just us. I'm not worried about it at all because I have this wonderful and fleeting confidence that alcohol and the possibility of getting some action this weekend will give a young man. PBR and hormones, baby. So I'll skip the daytime activities as they don't matter here. We just had a regular fun time with family. And we returned to our cabin for the night. Our room was upstairs in this sort of loft area. The cabin was oldish and rustic and just empty. Not physically empty, just void of something. The kind of emptiness you can feel. But hey, we're way out in the woods and no one has probably been here in ages. Of course it feels dead in here. That night was when it happened, and I'm positive that I'll miss a bunch of details as I blocked it out of my memory until I saw this subreddit and it all came back. I'm sleeping in this god-awful mattress next to Caitlin, and I drift off and have the most horrible nightmares. They weren't dreams, though. It was exactly real. It was as though my soul was able to move around and interact with the bedroom our bodies were lying fast in, asleep. But I was awake. My body was asleep, but I was somehow completely mobile without a body. The bedroom was dark and the moonlight from the window lit up the center of the room. And there were so many people there, all deceased, standing in a circle chanting. In the center of their circle, I see a little girl with blonde hair, maybe seven years old, and she's in this white dress, almost glowing in the most disturbing way. The people turn to me as they notice that I'm watching and aware. They slowly approach me, all chanting and murmuring. I can't remember the words exactly, but I'm positive they were performing a ritual and sacrificing or murdering this little girl. It was kind of like the scene from Rosemary's Baby, something that I never saw until very recently, by the way. They came at me with their hands outstretched, looking dead and rotten. And as they begin to strangle me, I wake up. And waking up is usually when everything goes back to normal. But I wake up and I see the rocking chair is rocking, like flying, as if somebody slammed it. At this point, I'm like, nope, F this. I close my eyes and just pray and hope that the sun will rise. It didn't. I fell back asleep. The next dream goes like this. I'm on a roller coaster with all sorts of people, and it's going straight up to the sky, like into heaven. I'm happy and stoked and cheering, and right before we get through the pearly gates, the roller coaster goes down, straight down, into the earth and into the fire and into hell. And I can hear blood curdling screams for help. So much agony and terror. It was the most awful thing I've ever experienced. I could feel the burn of the fire and the pain of the screams surrounding me. Finally, I wake up and the sun's up. I'm covered in sweat. And I look over to see my girlfriend in the fetal position, shaking and crying. I ask her what's wrong, knowing that I already know the answer, but hoping it was something else. All she could say was, the girl, the girl. I asked her what happened, and she said she saw a little girl in a white dress standing in the middle of the room staring at us and dancing. She claimed she wasn't even asleep. She went on to explain how she'd wake up periodically to see the rocking chair just rocking its butt off. I hadn't even told her what I had seen, and she just confirmed everything, which made everything so much worse. I don't have an exciting end to this story. The next night and the night after, I didn't sleep. 
There was a Pawn Stars marathon on TV, thank God, and I stayed up all night with the lights on, blasting Pawn Stars to stay awake. I didn't sleep again until the car ride home. Caitlin and I talked about it maybe once or twice and then never spoke of it again. I'll never actually know what happened that night or if I was just crazy. All I can say for sure is I'm never going anywhere near that town again. As much as I'd like answers, I think I'd rather just forget about this one. About three months ago, I went backpacking in the Allegheny National Forest, and I heard drumming. At this point, I'm chalking that experience up to actual people banging on drums, but it was still strange. This weekend, we returned to the same trail system, Minister Creek. We set up camp at a different site, about three miles north of where we had stayed the last time. The evening was uneventful, and we went to bed in individual tents at about 9.30. About 2.30 in the morning, we were woken up by a huge boom. It was not a gunshot. It sounded more like a black powder cannon going off. It echoed throughout the valley. We came out of our tents and discussed what we had all heard, a little on edge since it was so close to us, but eventually tried going back to sleep. Now the boom really has nothing to do with what happened later, but it was just a weird night from the beginning. As I'm laying in my tent, unable to sleep, staring at the ceiling, I kept seeing shadows on the tent walls. I could swear that I saw a silhouette of a person walking toward the tent, but as soon as I would look, it would disappear as quickly as I noticed it. I decide I'm just seeing things, and I closed my eyes. And eventually, I fell asleep. The next thing I know, I'm being woken up by a young-sounding female voice saying, Dad, dad, dad. I jolt awake, unsure that I've actually heard this. So I'm just laying there, checking my watch, which says 5.13 a.m. I'm wide awake at this time. And about 30 seconds later, right next to my tent, I hear very urgently, dad, dad. There was something off about the voice too. It was just creepy. I got major chills, like nothing I've ever experienced. Now, A, my daughter didn't come with us, and B, there wasn't a single female in our small group. It's pitch black out. I see no flashlights, no more light from the fire. I'm trying to rationalize what I'm hearing, and I sit up in my tent, thinking maybe a camper from another site wandered into our site thinking she was at her dad's tent. Maybe I should help. I unzip my tent, shine my flashlight out, and I catch a glimpse of a black bear walking off into the woods. I uncontrollably at this point let out a huge oh f, waking up the rest of my group. The bear didn't care though and just walked off into the darkness. So of course we're searching around with our flashlights and there's nobody else around us. Clearly we don't think the bear said it. But this whole experience was just nuts. I mean, what did I hear? Maybe black bears do make noises that sound like a girl calling for her dad. Or maybe it was a ghost warning me that there was a bear. A guardian angel? Or maybe I had some kind of auditory hallucination. Either way, both of my experiences overnight backpacking in the Allegheny National Forest have been pretty weird. This is a real experience that happened to me when I was around 10, camping with my family at a provincial park in Newfoundland, Canada in the mid-1980s. In Newfoundland, there's a lot of traditional folklore about fairies and being fairy-led. It's sort of like being mesmerized and stolen away by the fairies, and although I've never really believed in that stuff, whenever I hear those tales, I can't help but think about this experience. We arrived at the campground in mid-afternoon. 
I remember that it was strangely empty. We saw no other occupied sites as we drove around, looking for the perfect spot. We picked our site, and as my parents were setting up, my older sister asked if she and I could go check out the little beach area, which was a shortish walk along a clearly marked downhill path through some birch woods. Our mum said yes, but told us to be back in two hours. We found the sign pointing us to the beach trail and headed down the path. Almost as soon as we were out of sight of the campground, things started to feel off. It was weirdly quiet, with a sort of muffled feeling. No birds calling, no breeze, just a thick, velvety silence. I also noticed that there were strange-looking ferns growing thickly along the path all around us. Ferns are not an unusual sight in the Newfoundland woods, but these were different from the ones I'd seen before. Bright, almost luminous green, and very, very large. Some were as tall as I was. I couldn't shake the feeling that there were people, or animals hiding in them, watching us pass by. Although it had been a lovely, clear day, the weather started to change as we walked. A low-lying fog rolled in as we descended first in tendrils close to the ground, then gradually rising around us as we went lower toward the water. Even living in Newfoundland, I had never walked into a fog like that before, and it did nothing to relieve the eerie feeling that I was trying to ignore. Finally, we arrived at a steep set of wooden stairs, and following them, we emerged onto a small, foggy beach. With the woods behind and above us, it felt very closed in and I started wishing that we were safely back with our parents at our campsite. My sister made a small noise beside me, and I turned to see what had caught her attention. Although I'd thought we were alone, I now noticed that there was a man several meters away, standing very still and gazing silently out over the water. My sister called out a friendly hello. It was Newfoundland in the 80s. People did that sort of thing but he didn't move or appear to hear her. After a minute or two, I started to feel nervous, so I talked my sister into heading back to our campsite. This is where things get a bit fuzzy. I don't remember leaving the beach, but the next thing I knew, we were on a wide, unfamiliar dirt road. It seemed like no time had passed, but I was tired and my legs and feet felt like I'd been walking for a long time. The sun was also pretty low in the sky, which was strange because I thought we'd been gone for less than an hour. I felt disoriented and I had no idea where we were, and I started to panic a bit, thinking that we were lost. My sister immediately went into protective older sibling mode, saying not to worry because she was pretty sure that she knew the way back. We headed off down the road in the direction she suggested and walked for about 45 minutes or so, until we finally emerged at the campground, not far from our campsite. It was now almost completely dark, and we ran to our trailer to find our dad there, worriedly asking where we had been. Although we thought we'd been gone for under two hours, my dad said we'd been gone for more than five. He said that our mom had headed to the beach to look for us while he had stayed to wait for us at the campsite. By now, full-on darkness was setting in, and our dad was worried that our mom hadn't returned with us. As he prepared to go out looking for her, she burst through the door, frantically saying that she'd run up and down the trail multiple times and still hadn't found us. She was amazed when she saw us. The only way to access that beach, aside from cutting through steep, thick woods, was to take that trail, and we had not passed her. Once we'd all calmed down, we ate dinner and headed to bed. As I lay in my bunk, I remember hearing my mom quietly tell my dad how creepy and strange the trail had felt. Although we'd planned to stay longer, we packed up and left quickly the following morning, and we never returned to that campground. I always wanted to try the car life thing after watching so many YouTubers who live in their vans and travel around the country. 
I lived in Fort Lauderdale for five years, and I thought that I would be stuck there and that was it. Then the pandemic hit, and when I checked my bank account, I was back paid thousands of dollars. Before I knew it, I was packing up all my stuff, and the landlord said I could leave all my furniture and that was fine. Now I'm on the 95 heading north, laughing, actually leaving. I couldn't believe it. I managed to get a hang of the whole car life thing, and I became more comfortable stealth parking in different places and not being detected. I hadn't done any off-grid stuff yet, but I was more comfortable by the time I reached Lake Tahoe. I was hiking, and I asked some guy with his dog if he knew where I could sleep in my car, because Tahoe seemed a little tricky. He said there was a place up in the mountains called Hope Valley. It sounded good, so off I went. Lake Tahoe is already very high in altitude, so this was a few thousand feet higher than that. It was this past July. As I reached the area, I saw a small parking lot that was an entrance to a wildlife nature preserve. It was closed and empty, so that would do. I'm all settled in with my blanket, and the sun is setting, and the temperature plummets. Before I know it, it's pitch black, and visibility is zero. I start to hear wolves howling, and at this point, I'm game. This was the experience I wanted. It was a little creepy, but I was fine. I was living what I would normally be watching on YouTube in my apartment. Before the sun went down, I noticed that there were garbage cans that were overfilled, about 15 feet from the car, at the entrance to the preserve. I finally drifted off to sleep, and I was awakened by something at 3 a.m. I couldn't see anything, anywhere, it was so dark. And then, I heard heavy footsteps, right outside my door. At this point, I am really freaked out. Then something brushes up against the car. I'm scared, and I'm not really sure what to do. I wait for a couple of minutes. Then I open the door, run around the car as fast as I could, and got in the driver's seat. I drove down the mountain and slept at a Motel 6 parking lot like a baby. I never made it through my first and only off-grid car camping adventure, and I won't forget it. The only other time that trip that something creepy happened was in Mount Shasta. I drove halfway up the mountain, parked on the side of the road, and got out and started walking to this trail. I made it about 70 yards, and I heard a low growl. I've never run so hard back to my car in my life. The rest of the trip was just the best hiking I've ever had in Montana. Still, I'll never forget the sound of those footsteps. First of all, I don't know if this will be scary to you, but it was for me when it happened, and I still get a little frightened when I remember. I can assure you that this story is 100% true. My story starts when I was 15 years old in 2012. Three of my very best friends and I decided to go camping. Luke, who was 17, Louis, who was 16, and Gary, who was 15. Since our dads all worked in the military, we had access to some woods that weren't very far away from our homes, three miles at most. Of course, we weren't trained on anything, but since I lived some time in the middle of the Amazon forest, I had confidence that I could handle a not very far from my house night. It was July, which is winter here in Brazil, and it was really cold, like five degrees Celsius kind of cold, and things were pretty much going as well as you would expect from a camp in the woods. We pretty much sat there and chatted until about one in the morning. Then we decided to take shifts in duos to watch out for any animals that could be near us. We were afraid of jaguars, but probably the most that could get near us would be some capybaras that are pretty common in the region. At around 4 a.m., Gary, my duo, was outside the tent calling for me to stay up with him. But as it was so cold, I wanted to stay inside saying that no animal would go near us with the noise we were making. After like five minutes of back and forth between us, 
we noticed that we couldn't hear any kind of forest noise. No crickets, owls, twigs breaking from passing animals, nothing. And a feeling of uneasiness began to grow between us. Now I know this whole thing of no forest noise and yada yada sounds a little bit cliche, but I swear that this is real. When something weird is about to happen, everything goes quiet. With this feeling that appeared, we stopped arguing and we started to pay attention for what was happening around us. We didn't want to wake up Luke and Lewis because we thought we were just being silly and nothing would happen. Then, from the middle of the woods, we hear a scream. It sounded like a woman screaming, but at the same time, it didn't. The scream sounded human, but something was off. It had a kind of animalistic tone to it. It's really hard to explain. I've searched all over the internet, and I can't find any creature that sounded like that. I firmly believe it was not a human screaming. Besides, what would a woman be doing in the woods, alone at night, screaming? With the sound, Luke and Lewis woke up, a little disoriented, while Gary and I jumped out of the tent and grabbed some sticks. That was the only thing we could find that would serve as a weapon. Needless to say, we didn't sleep the rest of the night, and we not so patiently awaited the morning. After what seemed to be hours, but was probably no more than five minutes, the forest resumed its regular noises, and we calmed down a little bit. When the sun rose, we packed our things as fast as we could, and left. When we were getting outside the forest, we told the military that was guarding the woods what we heard, but I'm not really sure if they believed some random teenagers. I'm still friends with those guys that camped with me, and every time I see them, I ask them if they remember this, and they all said that they do, and none of us can imagine what could have been screaming that night. We'll never know if we were in any real danger or not. I'm just glad that we got out of it alive. Redditor's psychological aunt, 8611, posted a story that happened to him on a hiking expedition. Here it is. As a young man, I loved to climb mountains. This is an amazing encounter that occurred to me on one climbing expedition. We had left a hut late one night. The intention was to summit a mountain in a single long push by climbing right through the night. It was bad weather in the middle of winter and there was deep snow. We were trying to find our way through a maze of crevasses on a glacier. I remember the howling winds and clouds moving rapidly through the sky as the bulk of the mountain loomed over us. There was a full moon, which would hide behind the clouds before emerging again. I remember seeing a man moving up the slope from below us. The first thing that struck me was that he didn't have a headlamp on. I yelled over the wind at my climbing partner, Let's go talk to this guy. What guy? He shouted back. That guy, I said, pointing down at the figure moving toward us. There was a pause. What guy? At this point, I remember losing it. That freaking guy right there. He's right there. And at that point, I looked back down to see absolutely nothing. Thinking he had fallen into a crevasse, we walked down, but we never found any tracks. There was no trace of anyone. In the years since, I have heard reports of similar encounters in that area. In fact, recently, the bones of a deceased climber from the 1970s were discovered, melted out of the ice. The news report reminded me of my mysterious climber from that night, and it just makes me wonder. I grew up in the countryside, right next to a national park frequently visited by nature lovers and bird enthusiasts. It was the kind of park where you're not really allowed to bike or ride horses, only walk or run. 
But ten-year-old me thought that was a stupid rule, and I did so anyway, because the trails were perfect for it. I knew full well that I wasn't supposed to do that, and I was caught a few times, but nothing much came of it apart from a half-hearted, don't do it again. And I did, of course, until one day something frightening happened that made me stop. My family were horse breeders, and I would often take one of the horses for a ride, usually in the Forbidden Park. This day, very early in the morning, the first day of the summer holiday, it was beautiful outside. Misty and foggy, yet a sky that promised a sunny day ahead. Since it was so early, before six o'clock, I knew there wouldn't be anybody on the trail to see me, so I let the horse set off full speed along the trail. I only slowed down on the part of the trail that got steep on one side leading down to the river, because the thought of one step too close to the edge was too much even for a kid with the next to non-existent risk assessment skills. Suddenly the horse came to a halt and refused to go any farther. I grew up with horses all my life, and I knew that that usually indicates you need to investigate. Is there something with the hooves? Did the horse spot something that spooked it? The hooves were fine, but the horse wouldn't move an inch. And that's when I saw it. Someone had set up a trap, a thin, sharp metal wire across the trail at perfect neck height for an adult. I stopped and looked around, but I didn't see anybody. The wire was well attached to two trees and impossible for me to remove. So I led the horse around it. And to do so, I had to walk a bit up into the wooded area on the side of the trail. This is when I heard singing. There's a song called Hey Tom to Gubar, and it was that melody, but the lyrics were different and sung in a muffled, sniggering voice. Today, I only remember parts of it, but it translated into something like, Hey all you runners, come here passing. Let the lifeblood pour out. I, as silently as I could, and with my heart in my throat, backed away, got up onto the horse, and hurried back the way I'd come as fast as I could. I knew that I had to tell somebody about it, but at the same time, I wanted to avoid admitting to riding a huge and very forbidden horse on those protected trails, so now I had a problem. The old stories about a man living in the shed in the woods a shed that was once a cottage for the local hunter, came back to me as I hung onto the horse for dear life. I got home and I told my older brother what had happened, and he went back there with me in tow. We found the wire trap, and after a while of searching, we also found a spear-like pole in the ground, right on the spot where you would land if you came running and jumped over the fallen tree on the trail. That's when we called the police. The area was searched and several similar traps were found, but there was no sight of the old man. The following summer, though, there was big news in the local paper about spear-like poles being found right under the water surface, directly under that little tower you're supposed to dive from at the lake. And black garbage bags filled with big rocks were found on the narrow bridge crossing the river, so that if a car had hit it, Chances are it would have gone off the road and into the water. Long story short, someone out there in the woods was making human traps. And I just about ran into one. I'm a bit mystified by what happened to me. I was out with a friend and the two of us were descending downhill from an old fortress. Just as the sun came down behind the mountain, everything went completely and utterly silent. One minute the birds were singing and chirping like crazy, and the next, dead silence. It was like somebody flipped a switch. You could only hear the wind rustling the dead and falling leaves. It took us a few moments to really notice the silence, before the silence almost became loud and noticeable. 
We kind of looked at each other and stopped to listen for a bit. And after a while, something that sounded like a flute could be heard coming from farther downhill. Every minute or so, we'd hear it. Five to six second intervals, nothing complex. It lasted maybe ten minutes, and then it suddenly stopped. After a while, we could hear birds and bugs and small animals again, even cars in the distance. But during those minutes we heard the flute, everything went deadly silent. The nearest wolves and bears and things like that are nowhere in this area, and there was just that odd music in the silence. So, I guess I'm just trying to figure out what in the world we experienced. So, I'm doing this challenge this year where I'm hiking at a new location every week. Yesterday, I was hiking with my friend in East Texas. He has indigenous blood, and so he's very sensitive to spirits. Anyway, we were a mile and a half into this trail, deep in the woods. It's Tuesday, around noon, so this state park is empty. I start seeing shadows of animals, I'm assuming. First, a white furry animal to my left. Then a large black shadow, about knee height, of what looked like a boar in front of me. I told my friend, and he just said, Oh, that's weird. We walk a couple more steps, and he sees a person ahead. But there's no one there. At least I didn't see it. We brush it off. Whatever. Maybe our eyes are playing tricks on us. And when he looks again, he can't see the person either. We move on. And then, all of a sudden... The air around us starts to feel super heavy and dark. Both of our chests start feeling tight, and there's pressure in the air. We both started hearing voices of people chattering on the other side of the wall of trees to our left. I was assuming that it was a campsite, because this park has so many campsites everywhere. We turn the corner of the trees, and literally no one is there. No campsite either. We both looked at each other and said our own protective prayers and kind of booked it out of there as fast as we could. It felt like we had stepped through a dark curtain or portal of some sort, because when we passed that little river and creek, everything felt lighter. The weight was lifted off our chests, and we had to stop and breathe and kind of reassess what had just happened. I don't know if anybody else has experienced something like this, but... It was definitely odd. Not too long ago, maybe four years, I was walking with my family on this trail. We did this often just as a family activity. And this time, we decided to walk along a new trail. After we walked for a bit, my father saw some rubble in the distance and said we should go check it out. We walked up to it, and it appeared to be stone buildings, very decayed and barely intact. Just half of one of each walls was standing, enough to tell what the building could have been, but nowhere near an intact structure. But then off in the distance a little bit, I noticed a staircase, the same type of stone, but somehow completely different. This staircase looked as though it hadn't aged at all. Completely disregarding this, I stepped on them and I walked up to the top. I looked around and saw nothing else. I told my father to come up, but he said that I should come down. And then I remember feeling this weird feeling I was filled with dread, mingled with a feeling of being lost. I came down and we walked a little bit more before leaving. A couple weeks ago, I mentioned this to my friends, and they insisted that we go to check it out. I brought them to the ruins, but they were gone. I know I went to the exact spot, but it was like they never existed.
When this Redditor was traveling through Valley Forge National Park, they decided to pull over to capture the gorgeous moon. What happened next was an experience they've not yet forgotten. Here's the story. Sometime last year, we experienced a unique lunar event. I believe it was called the Super Blood Moon, but whatever it was called, it was absolutely enormous. It lit up the sky, was larger than any moon I had ever seen before, and it was beautiful. During this event, I was traveling through Valley Forge National Park at about nine o'clock at night. Admiring the moon, I decided I wanted to take a picture of it, if I could do so safely. Fortunately, up on my right, I saw a parking area that still had its gate open. I pulled in so as to be safely out of the road, but only so far. I didn't want to go all the way into the lot for some reason. I stopped my car, exited the vehicle, and pulled out my phone. Kneeling down, I began to set up for my shot. The moon in view, I lifted my finger to take the photo and stopped. Every hair on the back of my neck was standing on end. Without warning and seemingly without reason, I felt an intense feeling of dread come over me. I felt as though a crowd of people was pressing in on every side, inching ever closer to me, some close enough to reach out and touch me. I closed my eyes for a moment and then turned around. Nothing. Facing the blackness did nothing to calm my nerves, though. In fact, seeing no visible reason for my fear only intensified it. Something in me felt as though I had pinpointed the source. I just couldn't see it. Not wanting to miss my chance to catch a photo of this beautiful moon, though, I turned around to face the camera once more. My hands shook, and I said into the night, I just want to take a picture of the moon, and then I'll be leaving, I promise. After saying this, I felt a slight reprieve in the oppressive feeling, and took two photos. Neither was in focus, though, and at that point I was so terrified that all I could think of was leaving. Cutting my losses on the shot, I took my phone and tripod, my two blurry photos, and scrambled to get back into the car. Throwing the car in reverse, I got out of that area as fast as I could. To this day, I have never stopped there again at night, and I don't intend to. Redditor OK Armadillo 3754 went out on a two-week trip through Washington with his girlfriend. They decided not to plan anything and just see where the trip took them. They got a little bit more of the unplanned than they bargained for. This is their story. A couple of years ago, my girlfriend and I decided to take a two-week trip to Washington State. One of the main goals of our trip was to plan virtually nothing. We wanted to take off, let adventure guide us, stop when we saw something cool, and go back home when it was time. So that's what we did. We started out and just made it up as we went along. It was incredible. First we visited Yakima, Washington. Then we traveled over to Seattle, wandered through Olympia, explored Bremerton, and eventually made it to Forks. At this point, we decided to go to the Ho Rainforest, which is one of the largest temperate rainforests in the United States. After we'd been there for a while, wandering through in the car, we realized we'd somehow gotten lost. In fact, we were about 20 miles off track, and we ended up in what looked like a tree logging operation. Everywhere we looked, we saw these wide open sections with tree stumps as far as the eye could see. Traveling through this area, the sun began to set. I can't remember exactly what time of day it was when we saw it, but off in the distance, maybe 100 to 125 yards, I saw movement. Whatever it was, it was moving quite fast, and that intrigued me. 
I slowed down the car and kept my eyes on the figure, trying to see what it was. At first, I thought it was just a bear. Then, as it passed through a cleared area, I realized something that made my hair stand on end. It was running on its hind legs. I watched for about 15 seconds before this thing finally disappeared into the forest. Whatever it was, it was going at least 30 miles per hour on its hind legs, over quite a distance. I have no explanation for what we saw, but whatever it was, it was no bear. When Redditor Dr. Jim Danger and his friends went camping at 18 years old, they met and hung out with a strange old man. It wasn't until two months later that they realized the eccentric man in the woods was far more dangerous than they'd realized. This is their story. When I was about 18, some friends and I took a road trip about seven hours or so down to the Apalachicola National Forest near Tallahassee, Florida. We were going to do a little car camping, drink a few ice cold natty lights, you know, 18 year old stuff. As such though, we didn't want to be bothered by any park rangers, so we drove way into the woods. We got there, set up camp, had said natty lights, and one of the guys in our group and I decided to do a little exploring. We walked about a hundred yards from our site back to the main road and saw another path directly across from us. We started walking. Immediately, we started to see signs that somebody had lived there for a while. Big bags of trash, stuff like that. Should have been a huge red flag to turn around. But, you know, 18. Nothing could hurt us, right? So we get to this campsite of an older white guy living out of his van. Clothesline strung up, coolers placed around it, and a big gorgeous dog. I think maybe a golden retriever. We tried to back out, but he sees us and starts talking. He's friendly enough, asks us where we're from, tells us about some cool spots to check out in the park, and we ended up chatting for 10 minutes or so before going on our way. I kept thinking to myself how odd it was that he gave us directions in steps, not yards or miles. The guy always seemed to be off balance, too. Not stumbling drunk, but more like he was walking on a balance beam, swaying side to side. The other thing that seemed a little odd was how absolutely enthusiastic he was when talking about the national parks and forests where we were from. I mean, super excited. But whatever, right? We shook it off. The camping part was over and we went back to our tents. The rest of the trip went well and we didn't think about it again until two months later. The same buddy that I'd met that guy with calls me really late at night, wakes me up, tells me to turn on the TV to the news. I oblige. I see an old dude with a van. You see where this is headed, but I didn't. So I got pretty pissed at my friend for waking me up. I was about to hang up when he said, no, watch. And then, I see the golden retriever, and it all clicks. What the heck? The news report was about a murder. A few, actually. That man's name was Gary Michael Hilton, convicted of at least four murders. He kidnapped and murdered a girl on Blood Mountain, Georgia, an older couple in North Carolina, and a girl in the Apalachicola literally at the campsite that we had spoken to him on, not that long after we left. And yes, all of the places where he had victims were the very same places he had been so enthusiastically talking to us about. Obviously, we call the cops. They put us in touch with the Florida Bureau of Investigation, and we get flown down to take investigators to the campsite. 
We pointed out every spot where we'd seen anything, told them exactly what he told us, and showed them the places he described to us. I didn't find out until after the trial, but apparently they found what appeared to be partially destroyed human finger bones in an area near the site. We even had to fly down to testify. To this day, it's the craziest thing I've ever experienced, and I'd be more than happy if it stayed that way. My grandparents moved from Ohio in the late 70s to start a life in Florida. An opportunity to manage a ranch was a dream come true for them. When I was about eight years old, I used to visit them once a month for around two weeks each to stay. I loved it. The smell of cow manure brings me to a special time in my life, but it also brings back horrifying memories. The ranch is located in Florida not much history was given to my grandparents before arriving. Shortly after, the owners started to spill the beans. Bound by contract, my grandparents had an obligation to stay for the span of 10 years. The land had some native history as well as an unfortunate side in the front of the house of the property. An old Navy sailor hung himself several years before. The land has several different ponds and trails, which made for awesome adventures. I had a lot of fun, until my strange experience. My father and I decided to go fishing at one of the more interesting ponds. At the time, I had no idea what made this pond so interesting. But later, when I was an adult, I was told why. The pond was shaped like a donut and had a small mound at the center of the pond, around 45 feet from the shore. It was perfectly centered. From my understanding, somebody was buried at the center of this pond. Not sure if this is true, mostly stories and no real evidence. But anyhow, my father and I began fishing. I grabbed my small bait caster sized rod and began to hook a worm by the hook. I used a little red and white bobber. I was the type that wanted to fish away from anyone as I thought it would raise my chance of catching something. But that day, something caught me. I cast my line in the water and sat down right at the edge of the water with my feet slightly in it. I felt like a man with my rubber boots like my old man. About 20 minutes or so later, I noticed my bobber was going under and back up, so I decided to set my hook. As I tugged back, it felt like something big was on the line. I tugged and reeled, tugged harder and reeled, and my line wouldn't let go. It was stuck on something. At this point, my father was on the other side of the mound and out of my sight. So, in big boy fashion, I decided to walk into the water to see if I could tug it in a different direction, possibly freeing my line. I'm about four feet in, and the water was just at the edge of my knee-high boots. I'm not sure if this made sense, but it felt like it was what I was supposed to do. Finally, after tugging my line even harder, it was freed, as though nothing had ever been on it in the first place. Even the worm was still hanging off the hook. Feeling proud, I decided to walk out of the water and recast my line. This is where things got crazy. About a foot away from being completely out of the water, my left foot slipped on a rock. I brought my right foot forward to catch my balance, and a smaller stone dug itself into the shin of my left leg. It hurt like hell. As I realized what had just happened, I went to pull my left leg forward, but I couldn't. I felt my foot pulling back. I struggled trying to pull my leg forward, even spinning around with my butt now in the water. I started to scream yelling for my father. It was as if my scream fell on deaf ears. I was being pulled into the water by something. I didn't feel hands or anything actually on my foot. It's just that my leg was not free and I was gradually going farther and farther into the water. I was screaming bloody murder at this point 
And after about 20 seconds of fighting and yelling, whatever had my foot let go. I was soaked and horrified. I ran to my father, screaming, bleeding from my left leg and in somewhat of a shock. While yelling, I asked my father, why didn't you come to me when I was screaming? My father, now shaking because of what I looked like, said, son, I didn't hear any screaming. I couldn't see you from the other side. I'm calming down a little bit at this point, and I asked him again. His reply was the same. I didn't hear you, son. Needless to say, after showing my father and explaining what happened to me, like most parents would, he just shrugged it off and said that my imagination had gotten the best of me. I never fished on that property again. Nobody actually believes it happened. They all tell me that I was caught on something or I made it up or it was all in my head. And I know that this is something that sounds outlandish, but something that I couldn't see had me that day and it wanted me. I'm not here to convince anybody, just to share.